speaking of the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group, um, Ms. Lee, will you call the roll for us, please? Sure. Um, one second. All right. Uh, Justice Duker? I'm here. Mary Baldwin? Here. Becky Sandifer? Present. Marta Alkenbrock? Present. Reem Alos? I believe Reem is here. Reem, can you unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, yes, now I can, perfect. Uh, Judge Wendy Chang? Here. David Angstrom? Bridget Grammy? Here. Tom Green? Daniel Grunfeld? Here. Eric Helland? Here. Kathy Huang? Michael Liberty? Here. John Lund? Here. Ruby Marquez? Kevin Moore? Here. Crispin Passmore? Here. Toby Rothschild? Here. Jim Sandman? Here. And Patricia Scutiera? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Lee, have any uh, members of the public identified that they would like to speak today? Yes, uh, we have one, Charlie Gillig. Uh, Charlie, um, anybody who will be giving public comments will be limited to two minutes. Please, sir, go okay. ahead and share with us your thoughts. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I work at Neighborhood Legal Services of Los Angeles. Um, I want to make a brief point about consumer protection. Um, when we consider uh, various consumer protections, I think we primarily think about protection against bad or incompetent actors within a sandbox or regulatory scheme. But another important, important threat is from malevolent actors outside of the regulatory scheme who claim to vulnerable individuals that they're within it. For instance, in the off-use example of notario fraud in the immigration law context, one of the common key deceptions was that non-licensed or BIA accredited individuals were presenting themselves as lawyers to potential clients and then providing harmful advice at unreasonable costs. Uh, like many people in the working group, I expect a future where a large segment of legal services and information are provided through the sort of online portals that remote assistants were talking about in this working group. Uh, in this proliferation, I worry uh, that we should be attentive to potential consumer protection harms, both within and outside of the regulatory schemes. Uh, while a future legal uh, services regulatory body may be able to collect data and run randomized trials on the quality of licensed services, uh, is it going to be prepared and adequately funded to prevent against predatory online legal services who claim to be licensed, particularly those targeting low-income immigrant communities? Uh, so I urge the working group to consider this uh, serious threat when considering short and long-term recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gillig. Uh, any other members of the public, Ms. Lee? Yes, we have uh, Stephanie Bond. Ms. Bond, please share your thoughts. Again, limited to two minutes. Hello, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Terrific. Uh, I just wanna make a very quick comment. I've attended all these meetings so far and I would like to see that some uh, concern for the service providers be taken into account. It's There's a lot of interest on the consumer protection, but uh, I'd like to see more concern being taken for the needs of the service providers. That's part of what access to justice needs is that their concerns are taken into account as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bond. Ms. Lee, were there other participants? Um, if anybody else who has joined the meeting would like to give public comment, please uh, use the raise hand function. Otherwise, we'll move on with the rest of the agenda. Okay. I think we're good. Okay, thank you. So next, uh, as part of the chair's report, a brief announcement. I believe this is hot off the press yesterday, at least in part. Uh, the California Supreme Court has approved proposed amendments to rules 1.1 and 5.4 um, as suggested with some minor revisions in the, in the case of the 5.4 rule by the ADOS committee. Rule 1.1 was the one of uh, the recommendation about requiring lawyers to uh, include in competence their uh, competence in technology 
And the amendment on 5.4 uh, had to do with expanding to the settlement context the opportunity to share fees with non-lawyers. So uh, congratulations to those of you who worked on uh, this effort for adults. And uh, staff promises that they will circulate the order so you all can see uh, exactly what it is that the Supreme Court has now approved and that will be uh, effective as of March 22nd, 2021. So uh, that's good news I wanna share. I wanna turn things over to, um, to Randy to give our staff report. Sorry, unmute. Just a few items this morning for the staff report. Uh, we've been diligently working with leadership to put together a meeting schedule for this year. Uh, we didn't uh, attempt to uh, uh, move into uh, 2022 20, uh, yet, but we have arrived at a schedule for 2021. And Lauren or Angela will be sending that out uh, today, maybe even in real time during the meeting. Uh, we ask you to take a look at it, put it on your calendars. If you have any immediate uh, irreconcilable conflicts, let us know because we are monitoring to see that we absolutely have a quorum for all of those dates. Uh, but that calendar is now embedded and settled um, on the leadership side. So we're sending it out to you uh, now. Um, in the materials for the staff report, uh, I provided a memorandum with uh, essentially a a protocol for the sharing of articles. We've had uh, some members of the working group interested in uh, communicating with their colleagues by sharing things that they've seen, things of interest, reports, studies, uh, media coverage. And the protocol really is uh, we have established a OneDrive for CTKG, an, a cloud sharing uh, uh, facility. And you are all actually able to upload articles to that OneDrive yourselves. Um, and so if you do see something that's relevant to the work of this group that is of interest, we invite you to upload it, let us know. Or if you don't want to upload it yourself, you can send it to staff, you can send it to Angela, uh, and uh, we will uh, upload it. Uh, there's an article specific, excuse me, there's a folder specifically for articles, uh, reports, and other similar resources. And that would probably be your first place uh, to look for new content. Um, we also sent around a syllabus, a reading list. And I think, I think I'd like to call that the extra credit homework for the working group. And so definitely you need to read all the assignments and the agenda materials that come out. But if you're still wanting more, the syllabus that we've created uh, has sort of the, the best picks from the resources that we've collected, both from the ADELS project, as well as more recently for CTJG itself. And we invite you to use that reading list uh, for your own self-education. Again, as we carry out this work, there's a lot of uh, great stuff there. Um, and we will probably be updating it periodically. But for now, those are the things that we think would be the most valuable. If, if you had time on your hands and you wanted to commit more to learning about this as we go forward, that's, where, that's your go-to place for finding things uh, to read. If you did see an article and it wasn't something you think we should just upload to the OneDrive and let people know to go self-service and check it out, you thought it was extremely uh, significant, uh, just alert staff and staff will work with leadership. Maybe we'll put it on the agenda as part of a staff report or, or something else, or maybe we'll just email it out to everybody. But you know that should be reserved for only those most significant things. Uh, assignment process. And so we just went through our first assignment process. And uh, basically the way it works is we formed at the last meeting or following the last meeting, two subcommittees, at least to start, a scope subcommittee and a, a, a SAGE subcommittee. And the subcommittees receive assignments from staff uh, following discussion with leadership uh, to work up uh, certain uh, studies and recommendations. And the first ones are on the agenda this time. And what we do is we send out an assignment memo with background materials, and we invite the subcommittee members to review it and then provide an email, just send it into staff. Um, and we will collect those emails and provide them to the co-chairs of the subcommittee. Uh, so they have a little bit of an idea uh, what the thinking is of the subcommittee members. And it does look like now that we will be having subcommittee meetings basically between each uh, 
full working group meeting. The schedule hasn't been set. We're, we're still working it out. Both subcommittees have offered the best sort of dates, times that work for them. So we will be finalizing those as we go forward. If the subcommittee meeting that's scheduled is not needed, it'll probably just be canceled, which is fine. But I, I encourage you not to just rely on the subcommittee meetings to share your views or to begin sort of the thinking of it. As soon as the assignment mailing goes out, I think it'd be very helpful to both your colleagues on the subcommittee and the co-chairs if you shared your uh, thoughts in advance through emails. And then when you have your subcommittee meeting, of course, you can discuss it further, uh, but the co-chairs would be taking all of that input and then turning it into a submission, just as they have for this meeting, of really the subcommittee report. And when the subcommittee report is posted, it's not going to be completely 10 days before the meeting. That's the due date for the agenda document and notice, but maybe the week before the, the actual meeting, we try to get the agenda materials posted. You'll get another email from staff inviting you to submit emails on the materials that have been posted. And the prize for this meeting goes to Crispin as the person who submitted an email on the agenda materials. And the reason why that is so helpful is that uh, rather than sort of figuring out for the first time when we're sitting down and, and, and talking in plenary session, which we only actually have a few of, uh, collecting those thoughts in the emails allows both the co-chairs of your subcommittee and the leadership of the working group to sort of plan the, the deliberative process in terms of things that need to be discussed in, in these main meetings. Um, it's also an opportunity if you are not on SAGE, uh, you're, say you're on SCOPE, and you read the, the SAGE uh, agenda materials that have been posted and you have thoughts, that's your opportunity not to be frozen out of that discussion and only be able to talk about it during the meeting itself. Send your email comments on the other subcommittees uh, matters and, and you will be able to get that into the hands of the co-chairs and they will look at it as part of their presentation to the full group. So we, we don't want you to feel like this is a siloed process, you have the opportunity uh, to communicate. Uh, let's see. The last point is the work plan. And the work plan, this is the first time we are moving to the rolling assignments. And so we had two assignments we made in January one to the scope committee, subcommittee, and one to the SAGE subcommittee uh, to work on a scope document, to work on a structure and governance document. But at the end of this meeting, we'll be talking about the next assignment. And the next assignment will actually be going out to the scope subcommittee to begin looking at the application process and criteria for the sandbox. And so we, we don't unfortunately have the luxury of being able to myoptically focus on just one topic and, and work it till we're done, we're gonna have to be multitasking to meet all of the tasks that the board has put into our charter. And so there will be these rolling assignments. And so um, the next assignment will go out to scope and then at our next meeting, a new assignment will go out to SAGE. But as you start, if you're on scope, to take back the discussion we have today to your next subcommittee meeting, and move your scope of uh, sandbox discussion to the next level, you should also begin uh, starting to look at the application and criteria process. Um, and so instead of one item on your subcommittee agenda, you'll probably have two, which will be true of SAGE following the next meeting. And so we have uh, scoped out the project plan such that if we have three plenary sessions of the working group with subcommittee meetings in between, it's our hope that that will bring closure, we'll actually be taking a vote at that third discussion. So not intended to put pressure, it's not supposed to arbitrarily create uh, unreasonable deadlines, but if we stay on that schedule, if each assignment essentially comes back to the working group three times and at the third time we vote on it, we will complete everything on the charter. And so um, the rolling assignments begin at the end of this meeting. And that's all I have, uh, unless there's any questions. Well, thank you very much. Let me just jump in with a comment, and that's a thank you on that syllabus that you distributed for everybody yesterday. 
Uh, I want to thank Judge Chang and Team Grammy for getting that project started. And one of our members, I don't remember who, who said during the subcommittee, couldn't we have some resources, some more things to read? Those were the things that caused me to think, you know, some of these resources that, that I've had pointed out to me would be really helpful for other members of the committee as well. So um, a, a lot of uh, work on the part of the bar staff and those members of our working group who uh, instigated getting that list put together. Um, and I, I, I've read several of the things and found them very, very useful. For example, the New York uh, County Bar Association report on online legal services. I, I've learned a lot. Um, so I commend those resources to, to you. Um, and with that, I think we should move to our next agenda item, which is approval of the open session action summary from our last meeting on January 14th. Is there anyone prepared? Uh, uh, Justice Tucker, yeah. could I just jump in real quick? I did see a, a question posted with regard to how subcommittee members are able to communicate amongst themselves. And oh, we do okay. have the subcommittee meetings for that purpose. But if you wanted to share comments or have discussions among each other, we, we do have to be careful because uh, there is the risk of a a serial uh, meeting if there's a daisy chain of communications that amounts to a majority of the subcommittee. So what we are asking, if you want to uh, send a comment out to your uh, committee members, uh, that you send it to staff and staff will turn it around. Uh, just send uh, to the uh, CTJG box or send it to Angela. And if you want to send to a particular subcommittee member or all of your subcommittee members, we will turn those around for you. Uh, that's our, our safety net to avoid those issues. And just to clarify, that safety net is necessary if you want to communicate with an entire subcommittee, but members of the subcommittee are free to speak with each other in developing whatever ideas they want to develop, aren't they? As long as it's just a conversation amongst members. Yes, and so the rule of thumb is less than three. If, 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 if two people or three people are having a dialogue and you don't share that with anybody else, uh, then that's uh, likely to be safe. But um, the, the safest thing to do is to uh, share it with staff and let us be sort of your uh, hub for these communications. It also allows us to keep a record uh, for California Public Records Act uh, requests. Okay, I didn't see that question where it popped up. Are, is that from chat or somebody who, just so I, let me, in, in that vein, let me just um, mention that as we get into discussion today, I'm going to encourage people to use the raise hand feature so that we know when you have a, a comment you want to make. Um, I'm not going to be monitoring, and I think many of us aren't able to do two things at once and won't be monitoring the chat. So we really do want you to, to uh, share your comment uh, orally with folks and would encourage you to raise your raise your hand electronically to make sure that we uh, that I that I recognize that you have a contribution to make and, and I'll be calling on folks that way or Mimi will be helping me call on folks that way. Um, okay with that I think we can go to the next item and I can ask if there's anybody prepared to make a motion to approve the open session action summary from our January meeting. So moved. Thank you Toby. Any second? I second the motion. Thank you, Patricia, for seconding. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have uh, Ms. Lee, would you please take the roll because all votes need to be by roll call when we meet this way electronically. Um, Marta Al Alkenbrock? Yes. Uh, Reem Olive? Reem is on. Yes, sorry. Uh, Mary Baldwin. Yes. Judge Wendy Chang. Yes. David Engstrom. Bridget Grammy. Sorry, yes. <laughs> um, Tom Green. Daniel Grunfeld. Yes. Eric Helland. Yes. Kathy Huang. Yes. Michael Liberty? Yes. John Lund? Yes. Ruby Marquez? Kevin Moore? Moved. 
Crispin Passmore? Yes. Toby Rothschild? Yes. Rebecca Sandifer? Yes. James Sandman? Yes. Patricia Scutiera? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I vote yes as well. Um, which brings us to our next agenda item. It's a presentation from uh, Crispin Passmore. Um, we asked that, uh, I, I thought it would be useful for us to focus on concrete specific examples of what legal service providers are doing in jurisdictions where they are not bound by the laws and rules they're bound by in California. So uh, since Mr. Passmore has a great perspective on that issue, I've asked him to address that topic and relatedly um, when, uh, when regulators through a sandbox or otherwise have allowed um, these novel forms, what specific regulatory safeguards associated with which particular kinds of legal service providers have they found useful? So Crispin, thank you for uh, preparing some thoughts to share with us on that topic. Turning it over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I will go through the process of sharing my screen. Um, I'm sure within a few meetings, you'll be fed up from hearing from me. I'm not sure two, two on the trot is fair on all of you, uh, but I'll try and make this interesting. There's quite a few screenshots of, of uh, websites from different legal businesses. Uh, what I want to do is just quickly remind uh, how solicitors can practice in England and Wales. Most of the examples are from England and Wales because that's where there's the most variety inevitably with non-lawyer ownership and, and different ways of practicing. Um, so just looking to, to refresh on how solicitors can practice, they can practice in a, in a regulated law firm, uh, whether that's a traditional lawyer partnership or an ABS, they can be in-house. And also they can be in an unregulated business, not doing the, the reserved activities. So that really short list of things that is equivalent to your unauthorized practice of law. You know, lawyers can work in, in, in a business delivering legal services alongside non-lawyers delivering those services as well. And the protections that a client gets depends to some extent on the type of business that they are, the solicitor is practicing through. Uh, and some of the protections are you know, obviously focused on individual and small business clients because the protections we would want to put in place for those sorts of clients uh, are probably different than, than most people would think was appropriate for corporate clients. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll pick up a few of those protections just so you're aware of them. We have a legal ombudsman, so this deals with not regulatory issues, not professional misconduct, but what we would call redress if there's poor service. Um, they can make a lawyer say sorry, they can make a lawyer speed up if they've you know, got stuck and, and not, not done any work on a case. They can pay compensation for distress or, or, or loss, etc. That's run separate to regulators, but it's quite an important protection for anybody that gets advice from a solicitor or certain other types of lawyer. We have really clear uh, indemnity insurance rules um, I'm not sure these are ones that I would suggest any other jurisdiction copies. They're hugely expensive, um, but every regulated law firm has, whether it's an ABS or a traditional firm, has a minimum of two million pounds worth of cover. Um, that's a two million cover on each and every claim with no aggregation limit. So there's no sideways limit on that cover. Uh, hence, it's very, very expensive for, for law firms. Small firms might pay six, seven, eight, nine, even 10 percent of their turnover for this sort of cover. But, you know, it provides absolute gold standard protection for customers, um, even covers fraud uh, and, and all sorts of other things as well. I'll make sure these slides are uh, uploaded at an appropriate point so you can look at some of this stuff in more detail. Um, we also have a compensation fund uh, run by the regulator, run by the SRA, that's paid for by regulated firms and individual solicitors. Um, this, this is applied for firms, individual clients and small businesses with a turnover of, of less than two million. And it covers loss of money, either permanently or temporarily, um, by inappropriate action by a law firm. 
the the regulator has some very strong powers to intervene into law firms to close them down often they're in chaos when it does that and the trust account the client account as, as we call it is is often in chaos and the sra can provide liquidity into that while it unpicks the mess and um you know it can help house purchases go through it can um make sure trials go ahead because it can provide liquidity into into uh, what is often a, a, a chaos as well as paying out compensation if there's long-term loss as well but again that's a protection that applies across different sorts the sra also does quite a lot of work to support individuals to make choices within the legal market it does that through information on its own website it's just a, a screen grab there um, of, of some of it, which tells people what protections you get um, in, in different types of lawyer practice. But it also funds a separate website called Legal Choices uh, with the other legal regulators, which gives information uh, independently, factually, about legal issues and you choosing and using a legal advisor. Um, it's new, it's been in place for, for, for just two or three years, um, and I think it, it needs more investment to, to be really effective, and I think that's coming. But it's really part of a, of a move by the regulator, not just to provide people with information, but to help them make active and wise choices. So to help them compare legal service providers in the same way um, as we might use a comparison site to choose banks or um, insurance companies or, or um, telecoms businesses. But quite an important part of the protection landscape is to help consumers make good choices, I think. The SRA also provides what they call a digital badge. Um, so if a firm is regulated, um, then you can, as a customer, you can look out for the logo. Uh, there's a copy of it there. It's, it's a live digital logo, um, so it has today's date on it. So you can see what date I did a screen grab. Um, and if you click on it, then you'll see on the right that the uh, a screen, back, screen grab of um, what you get in return, which it in real time, it checks this, this genuinely is the website of a regulated firm, um, that it's not a spam website. It's not somebody copying a website of a regulated firm. You know, we heard in public comment concerns about people outside of regulation misbehaving well we see that as well uh, we see people creating websites and emails that look like they're from a regulated law firm this is one way of trying to give consumer protection in that space and then you click back and it takes you back to the um to the to the law firm's website it's also important because it tells you about the protections that are in place for that firm um, and it only it's only given to regulated law firms it doesn't you can't get that logo if you're a solicitor in an unregulated business or a solicitor practicing on your own or in-house it's only for regulated firms so it's a good way of helping customers recognize you know this firm is regulated so i'm just going to run through um, a whole bunch of different uh, examples of abs's and other sorts of businesses other ways of practicing um, that I think are interesting. Um, it's quite hard to pick them. There's over a thousand ABSs in England and Wales, um, and you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to cover a slide for all of them. Um, <laughs> I've got just under a thousand slides to, to, to run through. Um, but I think what's interesting is, is to ask as we go through, you know, are these business models and services good? Do we think they're good things to be offering? And are they available to the people and businesses in California if we, if we don't? make change. Lots of them are screen grabs, um, but there's also the web address um, on, on the side on e each of them as well, or most of them. Um, so when they're sent out, you can click and you can have a look around their websites and see what they are. And we'll take them through the different sorts of practice as well. So starting with some lawyers um, working in unregulated businesses. So they're not delivering reserved services on the whole. They're delivering general legal advice, write a will, um, you know, things that aren't court based uh, as well, mainly. First one's business called Farewell. It's a new business. It's just raised um, 20 million from private investment um, late last summer, which is its second round of investment. Uh, it partners quite often with charities uh, and it delivers uh, online will writing and some other things as well. But I think, you know, um, what a great slogan, the simpler way to deal with death. Um, 
run by a guy that's just really interested. He's a design um, uh, expert. His, his academic career is in design and how you, how you apply design thinking to services. So he comes at this as how do you present, bring design thinking to all of the issues related to death and they're gradually adding services. So write a will, arrange a funeral, arrange a cremation and apply for probate as well. What's interesting is probate's a reserved activity. So they have a subsidiary that is regulated um, that delivers the probate services and that regulated subsidiary would be an ABS, but wills are written um, using technology they employ some solicitors and they employ some paralegals as, as well but it's the technology that really is writing the wills it's captured real market share in the uk uh in its you know short life over the last couple of years really significant uh its growth last year in particular uh, this is a, a, a business um that again is is not regulated they have some some lawyers working in there um but it's, it doesn't hold, out, hold itself out as lawyers. Uh, in fact, it says, you know, we're not a lawyer business. It's called Amicable. Um, it, does, it does what it says it does. Um, it helps people separate amicably. It's not interested in divorces or unmarried couples separating where it's not amicable and there's gonna be conflict and disagreement. You know, they're the right cases to go, go to lawyers. But actually in our system, there's quite a lot of people that can reach agreement themselves over children, childcare, finances, et cetera, um, or could do that reaching of the agreement if they were facilitated in, in some way. And this provides that sort of a service um, where things need formal documenting under our current law on divorce, which is about to change later this year, then they work with independent lawyers where necessary. Again, it's had investment, it's growing, um, and you know, it's moving, it's moving beyond simply thinking of it as a legal service to providing support after separation with things like apps around co-parenting um, to manage the ongoing relationship and help people get support to deal with some of the emotions around co-parenting. Um, you know, when an ex uh, the other parent starts a new relationship or changes plans and all of those sorts of things. So again, I think interesting that it comes in not as we deliver legal services, although that is part of what they do, but it's packaged around relationship ending and around issues that the client sees rather than around legal issues. Uh, another smallish business uh, has some regulated solicitors in it, but it itself is not regulated, so it's not doing reserved services. It's focused, uh, it's called Hybrid Legal. Um, it delivers legal services to small and medium-sized businesses. Um, it doesn't just deliver fixed price uh, legal services, um, although it does do that if you want it. What it's really interesting model is a subscription service where um, they do some initial work with you, they get a sense of your needs as a business, and you pay them a monthly fee, and then, you know, you eat as much as you want at the buffet as a client. So they're sharing some of the risk with the client about volume, and they're creating some aligned incentives to help the client avoid the need for ongoing legal advice by getting their policies right, their contracts right, their systems right. Um, so they're not trying to create more demand for their service, they're route to profit is to create interestingly less demand for their service but again you know they're not a regulated business but there are solicitors working in it um similar sort of model but aimed more at big businesses aria grace law um run by ex city lawyers from uh large law firms they provide uh, a fee sharing model a platform that they bring clients, they provide the back office support and the technology and all of the money laundering compliance and all of those things, data security, all, all of that. And their lawyers provide um, services, usually to big clients, often to big technology companies, big finance businesses, banks, etc. cetera. Um, but it's not a regulated law firm. It's a, it looks like a law firm, but they're not doing reserve services. They're the sort of business that a bank might go to um, following the introduction of um, GDPR in the EU to update all of their agreements in 28 countries across the European Union. Um, and Aria Grace would be able to corral a group of lawyers to do that on a flexible model. 
I think what's interesting, um, you know, people are often concerned about non-lawyers coming into the market or unregulated firms coming into the market, just being about profit. Um, you know, their slogan is ethical world. Um, the people that run this um, take no more money out of the business than their frontline lawyers. Um, any excess profits are donated to charity um, and 5% of their turnover is donated to charity. Um, and they agree what the charities are with their lawyers and their clients at the beginning of each year. Um, you know, in interesting model. Um, a business that you'll recognise in the UK, uh, they have regulated solicitors at Rocket Lawyer, but Rocket Lawyer itself doesn't deserve, deliver reserved legal services, so it doesn't need to be an ABS. Um, so, you know, it wouldn't get the digital badge logo, for example. Um, they do things that you'd recognise uh, in the US, so easy to make legal documents. Um, but you can also ask a lawyer a question, and it's a lawyer employed by uh, Rocket Lawyer. It's not just a panel of lawyers in private practice that the work is subcontracted out to. Um, that's grown pretty substantially over the last few years. They came in through a sandbox. They were the first one um, to do that sort of work before the rules changed that allowed this um, to be in place without the need for a sandbox. Um, but again, interesting that, you know, I think I was asked when we were talking before, what, what's the impact on some of this stuff on pro bono? Well, you know, you can see there that they provide free ask a lawyer questions um, around the coronavirus for small businesses. You know, so they're just seeing that this is an opportunity to offer, um, you know, good public spirited support at a time of crisis. Perhaps they're not as busy as they were because of the, the, the lockdowns. And it's an opportunity to use their lawyers to do some good stuff. And of course, it's good for their brand building like pro bono is for any law firm as well. Um, aimed at small businesses, particularly, although they do do stuff for, particularly around document assembly uh, for individuals as well. But lots and lots of stuff for micro, micro businesses helping a plumber with their first employment or first lease, all of those really small events to, to you know, a big business that are big events to a really small business and helping them get them right at low cost and fixed prices uh, and ask lawyers questions around those without thinking that the clock's running um, and you're scared of asking the lawyer the question. Um, it's not just for profit businesses. Um, so we have a separate regime for regulating um, some non-profits, they don't need to be regulated um, as, a, as an ABS in certain circumstances. Uh, we have a huge history of non-profits outside of our lawyer regulatory system, employing lawyers um, and paralegals and delivering legal services. Central England Law Centre, um, I put that one in there because that's where I started my career in legal services a long, long time ago. Um, I was the, the chief exec there a long time ago. It's a thriving non-profit um, lots and lots of the lawyers that work there have gone on to be um, senior judges um, etc um, I think they employ probably five or ten lawyers in in Coventry and Birmingham um, but there's about 60 law centres around the country there's about 600 citizens advice citizen advice is mainly paralegal led but some of them have lawyers the law centres are always lawyer led um, in terms of who delivers the work, but the, the people that run the organisations are not lawyers, they're other members of the public that serve on, on charity boards and as such. And an interesting one there in the corner as well, Sheffield Hallam University, increasingly common for universities and law schools here to set up legal advice clinics um, as uh, independent organisations, either as a commercial um, body, you know, not necessarily profit seeking, but run as a, as a corporate entity or as a non-profit. Um, and part of the students studying law is to go and work in those and work with real clients on real issues and learn, learn law in the real world um, and increasingly seen as a, as a positive model. Changes to the way education and qualification as a lawyer um, that's come in this year in England and Wales makes this a really, really attractive model for universities because the, the time they students spend in there counts towards the period of work experience that they need. Again, you know, just an interesting example across all of those of services that are um, either ABSs, uh, as in Sheffield, or, or non-profit 
not needing to be an ABS, but delivering legal services that in most cases, in most jurisdictions would need to be a law firm to be able to deliver those services and thriving because they're non-profit, most of them don't charge for their work. Um, so, you know, hugely, hugely important in terms of anti-poverty, anti-discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so moving on to some of the ABSs. So when we talk about ABSs, these are regulated law firms. Um, as I said previously, you know, increasingly the SRA doesn't distinguish between ABSs and traditional law firms in how it regulates. Um, but there are some, some differences because of the, the legislation that sits behind. LegalZoom, again, a business that, that you know well in California, able to do more here than it can do um, in California. Um, it, it can help you write a will. Um, it can do small business work. Uh, they did own a, have a subsidiary. They've just disposed of it um, last year. Um, they, they, had a, they, they bought a law firm that was one of the top five conveyancing practices in the UK. Um, so they've done 500,000 homes bought and sold. Um, you know, I think what's interesting when I look at these sorts of, of businesses is how consumer led and consumer feedback they are in the way that they present their services with Google review, Trustpilot, um, FIFO and all of those different sorts of, of elements as well. But gradually moving in some ways like Rocket Lawyer, gradually moving from document assembly up the value chain to deliver more and more um, adjacent legal advice to document assembly. And I think what's interesting when they, when they give clients the choice, for example, on a trademark registration between do it yourself through document assembly and pay X amount fixed price for an attorney to help you, uh, but then more than half choose for a lawyer to help. Um, some confidence do it on their own, but a significant number want a lawyer to help them through that, whether that's a trademark, a will, um, you know, an employment contract, those sorts of things as well. But again, it's combining the technology, the, the strong customer focus with lawyers delivering real legal advice um, in a way that they've not been able to before they became an ABS. Moving on to some focused on, on uh, businesses. Uh, we've got real growth of multidisciplinary practice in England and Wales uh, since we had uh, not just ABS, but some further changes to make ABS's work particularly well for multidisciplinary practice. Knights is a um, really interesting combining of legal and other professional services, quite a lot of financial services in there. Um, they don't really operate in London. They see that as a expensive market and a competitive market to be in. So they're working across England and Wales, but mainly out of London. They're consolidating. So they're buying up law firms and other businesses as well. They're floated on, on our alternative investment market and they've done you know, really well and grown really well over the last 12 months in particular. They've had a really good 12 months as a business, but, but really bringing together a range of professional services. And I'll come back to that, I think, at the, at, at the end. Another multidisciplinary practice combines accountants, solicitors and architects. Surprise, surprise, it's property focused. Um, it's regulated by a range of um, regulators but you get genuine multidisciplinary practice from them. So, you know, it's not just that they've got three different businesses and one employs architects, one solicitors and one accountants. They bring the people together, they think together, they think as a team um, and they're focused on solving the client's problem as the client understands it, rather than saying, I can only offer you a legal solution or I can only offer this part of your, your problem. So if you wanna get planning permission, and build 10 houses on a piece of land you've got, they can do end to end all around the different bits of work. I think that's interesting because it takes risk away from customers. Why should customers have to take responsibility for making sure that there's no gaps between different professional advisors? And why should customers have to manage to make sure there's no duplication that they're paying for between those different professional advisors? and bringing it together in insurance, customer service, and all of those things as well. So it's really bringing the service together as the client experiences the problem rather than as this professional specialist conceives of their solution and their expertise being deployed. But Z Group, I think, is, a, is again, a really interesting business. 
Another one, um, smallish business again, Tease Law, brings together um, independent financial advice and legal services. Lots of this is focused on um, relationship breakdown and financial planning for well-off people. Um, and it combines the different elements of that that people need. The, you know, the, the legal services are obviously crucial, but actually so is independent financial advice as well. So they bring together the different professionals that they employ, tailored to the particular client's needs and the balance of different professionals um, that solve their particular problem. So again, multidisciplinary practice being a key part, I think, of, of what we see and how that helps customers. Uh, we can talk about what's changed in the UK without talking about the big four. They don't get a slide each, I'm afraid. Um, they can share. Um, all of them have grown in the UK. Um, I think everyone in England and Wales uh, in big law firms were scared of these four um, before ABS came and before multidisciplinary practice was really facilitated. I think they thought it was going to be like 25 years ago where they would buy law firms and they would they would run a law firm. Well, None of them have. Um, what they've done is they've integrated legal services into uh, adjacent markets to what they already do, be that cyber, um, uh, some mergers and acquisitions and financial deals and outsourcing. They recognize that um, specialist law firms are better at a whole bunch of things and they don't try to move into those markets to compete. But they're also fairly clear that if they're doing 80% of something for a client around a particular issue and they've got the capability and capacity to do the legal work as well, well, it might make sense for the client to have a one-stop shop for that. Um, this isn't the accountants taking over. Um, I think it's just worth remembering that lawyers are partners of these businesses as well. So the lawyers still own this business. It's just they jointly own it with other people as well. And in some parts of, of, of the world's practices for some of these of the big four, you might find that the accountants are down, down under a half of the partners in the business, that other professionals are growing in their significance within these businesses. They're genuine professional services firms rather than accountancy firms now. What constrains them is um, audit rules, um, particularly in the US, but in the UK and, and the EU as well. It's um, conflict on audit rules, Sarbanes-Oxley and all of those sorts of things as well. I think what's interesting when you think about them as global businesses is they really are global. When law firms talk about being global, they might have 10 or 20 offices. Uh, some of these have got over 100 offices. Some of them have got over 130 offices. I think at one point um, EY was opening um, six new jurisdictions a year for legal services. Um, you know, global law firms, if they can open one or two in a year, that's quite impressive. And that's because they've got multidisciplinary practices. They've already got offices in each of these jurisdictions. It's easy to add three or four lawyers in, into um, you know, one part of the building. The other thing just to note about them is because they're global businesses, they're not bound really by, um, by jurisdictional and geographical boundaries. Um, they've got ABSs in, in London. Um, if a global client wants advice on California law, there's not much that the California State Bar can do about it if a um, global client uses its base in London to go to a law firm in London that happens to be one of these and gets advice around that. So, you know, they can, they can like any business, they can they can pretty much route their work where they want to work. Um, and if their clients want them to do the work, they'll find a way of doing it. Increasingly, they have offices um, in the US. Um, in reality, they're sales offices, not practice offices, often in DC, um, but they're the front door to the global network. So there are lots and lots of US businesses, global US businesses that are buying legal services from these now to meet their legal needs in every jurisdiction beyond the US. And it seems a bit mad that US clients can't do that for their home state or home jurisdiction law as well. But they're growing. But you know, I think the thing to remember is, and it hasn't had a negative impact on city law firms, they've still grown as well. Um, whether they've grown as much as they would have done, who knows, we don't know the counterfactual. But this hasn't been the growth of these four, hasn't been the death of, of traditional law firms. But it's not just the big four of accountancy, there's you know, levels below that. 
Um, we've seen some of the, the smaller ones that I've talked about already on multidisciplinary practice, but there's other national law firms that are mixing legal services into you know, just wide ranging professional services firms. Kingston Smith Moore um, is, is one of them. Um, you know, again, just doing very similar sorts of things. And they're adding legal because their clients want them to add legal. Um, they're all, all businesses that I've spent a lot of time talking to before they moved into legal services when they were first thinking about it. And it was their clients that drove it. It wasn't them saying, here's a market opportunity. Why don't we see if we can drum up business? It was their clients saying, can you do the legals for us on this as well? Which I think tells us something. Um, businesses, again, um, US businesses, Elevate and United Lex. Um, alternative providers, law businesses, um, whatever people prefer to call them, enterprise legal services. They deliver um, subsidiaries or they have subsidiaries in uh, England and Wales that deliver regulated legal services. For Elevate, it's called Elevate Next UK. Um, for United Lex, it's called Marshall Denning after a couple of famous um, lawyers, one in the US and, and, and one in the UK, Marshall and, and, and Denning. Um, you know, clever use of, of using a bit of history to put a name on a new law firm. Um, but the London office of Marshall Denning is a subsidiary um, of um, United Lex, uh, but it also has branch offices across Europe as well. And that allows United Lex to deliver regulated legal services. It allows Elevate Next to, to, to deliver uh, regulated legal services. So going beyond the outsourcing and the project management and those things that these businesses have grown up doing over the last 20 years, the flexible lawyering, and into higher value work of legal services. Again, they're doing it because their customers asked them to do it. GCs are saying, well, you know, you're doing contract management for us, a contract review. Could you do this and the other things for us as well? So they set up regulated businesses to do it, um, both thriving in, 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 in the UK. Um, not many more to go. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is a litigation firm, PCB litigation. It's an ABS. Uh, it looks like a very traditional law firm. It just happens to have an equity stake held by Burford Capital, which is one of the world's largest litigation funders. Um, what litigation funding does is um, allows um, clients to manage risk on their balance sheet. It allows it to quantify risk and, and, and um, close it out, close out those risks on its balance sheet. Um, and their understanding of risk management, particularly combined with the um, PCB litigation's expertise in litigation has helped PCB grow and you know, be even more successful in a particular area of work of um, the sorts of things that are mentioned on the screen uh, for large, large corporate clients, something that just wouldn't have been possible without um, being able to set up as an ABS. Um, I thought I'd just leave this as a quote up. Um, Reed Smith, very traditional law firm. It doesn't deliver anything different in England and Wales than it delivers across all of its other jurisdictions around the world. But I think what's interesting is this is the press release when from, from their Europe and Middle East managing partner when they announced their ABS um, in 2019, I think it was, um, autumn 2019. Um, and I think what's interesting is, is that they see really um, that it positions them to be able to compete with the big four and all of the other multidisciplinary practices. It allows them to show that they value the non-lawyers. It allows them to, to expand their services um, in the same way as those multidisciplinary practices and the alternative providers are. Um, and perhaps what we're really talking about here is a coming together um, of um, law firms and other professional services, that they're ending up, because their clients are demanding it, they're ending up with different histories and different trajectories, but they're coming to the same point of they need to be professional services firms if they want to succeed in winning work from their clients. Um, you know, not delivering anything different, but by being an ABS, they see themselves as better positioned for the future. I thought I'd just go back and show all of those consumer protections for each of the examples I've given. Now, I won't run through these. I've put a traditional law firm at the top. Um, there's other protections you could go into, but these, these are the main um, things to think about. Key is that a solicitor is bound by exactly the same code of practice wherever and however they practice. 
It's exactly the same seven pages of ethics and standards, whether they're in a traditional law firm, an unregulated business, a charity, multidisciplinary practice, big law, wherever they are. Um, the non-lawyer owners of a regulated firm, of an ABS, have to be approved. Obviously, that's not needed in a, in a traditional law firm. And it doesn't happen in the businesses that are outside of our regulatory framework. That's not something that this sandbox is looking at, particularly here. So, you know, we're really only interested, I think, in um, the ownership structures that bring non-lawyers within the regulated firms. And what you can see there is they're exactly the same consumer protections as there are for traditional law firms. That's the way that we've built it in uh, England and Wales. And that's why we're able to say that we don't really um, treat them differently anymore after a few years of experience. What are the patterns in all of these services? Um, well, I think, yeah, you, you might see your own. And if you looked at a different bunch within the thousand ABSs, you, you might come to a different view. But what struck me over the last few years is how much the new services talk about what they do in terms of their client's problem rather than their lawyer's expertise. Um, I wrote a blog on that last year because it, it just struck me as something really interesting that when you look at traditional law firms, um, you can find out their areas of specialisms, you can search by a list of lawyers and their areas of specialisms. When you look at lots of the ABSs, their websites, they don't, they don't talk about their lawyers and their specialisms, they talk about their clients and the problems they have and the solutions that they can offer. And I think, that, I think that's what leads them to being increasingly multidisciplinary, whether it's multidisciplinary like Reed Smith and the Big Four, or whether it's multidisciplinary like someone helping um, think about death or relationship breakdown and co-parenting, it's increasingly a multidisciplinary model. And I think that's why we have to ask ourselves, what is it that is in the way of lawyers in California from combining with others to deliver the services that their clients are demanding and help them solve the problems they've got. And that's how I think we should think about this. Um, hopefully that's enough for you to you know, get a sense. Um, I'm sure you all look a little bit like that now after hearing from me yet again. Um, but I'm quite happy to take as many questions as you can come up with. Thank you. Crispin, thank you very much. I thought that was very interesting and helpful. And if people have questions for Crispin on what he just presented, by all means, share them. Uh, but if you have more general comments on the issues raised by what he presented, please save them until we shortly get into that as part of our discussion on scope. Are there raised hands? I don't see, I don't see any. Okay, let's take uh, let's take a three minute break and come back at eleven oh five for our scope discussion. We're gonna just so everybody knows we're gonna take our lunch break at twelve thirty from twelve thirty to one o'clock. All right, see you in a couple. We're doing it on Friday night in in the UK. Really appreciate you sticking with us through that. Uh, no problem. That bad timing. Um, I see that Wendy Chang has her hand up, so I'm going to call on her and then I'm gonna do something I probably should have done before the break, which is uh, ask John Lund to uh, comment on um, the topic we were just addressing, not specifically on, on what Crispin said, but on examples from Utah that flesh out some of the uh, subject of concrete examples and um, concrete protections. Okay, Wendy. Go ahead, Judge Chang. Uh, Crispin, forgive me if you've actually answered this question before. I realized as I was watching that I was just assuming that this was helping to close the access gap in England. Is it? Or is it too early to tell? Um, I, 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 it's always a really difficult question to answer because how on earth do you ever actually measure that and how do you measure what would have happened if you hadn't done it? Um, but I would say all the evidence points to, yes, it's helping close the access gap. Uh, it's particularly effective uh, helping close the access gap for middle classes and very small micro businesses. It's not a magic bullet. It doesn't, it doesn't make very poor people rich 
and that's the only real way to help you know people that are homeless for example get legal services um but it's helped with that because we've got more nonprofits than most jurisdictions appear to have uh, so we've got more places that people can get free legal advice that is lawyer um paralegal that's regulated um ethical and expert rather than relying on um you know less less positive and i recognize some of the challenges that that you, you've you've seen in california with notarios and things like that we have less of those sorts of problems because we have a stronger non-profit um structure because of our regulatory system it's clearest that we've got more innovation we've got more choice more services um more technology for middle classes and small businesses in particular but i wouldn't underplay the benefit it brings to large clients as well because in the end the best route out of poverty for people to close a, uh, an access gap is to have a job and if corporates are able to manage risk and manage their businesses more effectively then you know that's good for our economy and that's good for uh, tackling access to justice in the end as well thank you so john lund please share with us from utah examples that you might have thought about? Sure, um, this this is seems very mom and pop uh, compared to what Crispin just went through in terms of the level of sophistication and maturity of the structures that, that are in the UK uh, or England and Wales, maybe it's how you say that, but in any event, um, I just wanna mention a couple specifics which maybe go to Judge Chang's query a bit. Um, we, we have a lawyer in Utah who took outside investment from a business partner in order to build essentially a turbo tax model around the financial disclosure required for a divorce case. So someone can come in and utilize that system and uh, pay a flat fee. I don't remember the, what the pricing is on it. It's a few hundred dollars, I think, and come up with this appropriate document reflecting what the court will require. And that's a option apparently whether the person's operating pro, pro, uh, pro se and just wants that piece of help, or if they're working with a lawyer and the lawyer were to say, look, this is a more affordable way to get this compiled than to have my paralegal or my staff do it. So go on this line, go on this system, provide all the information and at least we'll get you, you know, 90% of the way without needing to cost, have it, have you cost, have it cost as much. So, um, that, that's that's an example. We have a similar um, uh, applicant that's doing that around estate planning, which you know, initial out of the outset, you say, well, that's that's sort of a thing for people with money, but not when you think about the broader end of life planning issues, um, need for medical directives, all of those things that that arise around that. And so, this outfit, which is called the State Guru, is partnering with lawyers. But they've also explored the idea that they could partner, for example, with a credit union and make that basic tool available through the credit union to the credit union's members. So I just mentioned that because I think the, the, the delivery systems for some of these services are, are, are what may be innovative more so than the actual uh, type of service. So and the last thing I'll, I'll just mention, if I may, Judge Tuker was listening to Crispin list, list, listen to consumer protection devices, and I came up with the A, B, C, D's, E of consumer protection around this, at least that are somewhat being used. A is for audits, because we are doing audits at this point. That may not scale up very well, but we're auditing the actual results, for example, that that disclosure tool might might the financial disclosure tool might generate we're we're asking them to verify that via audit b is for badges crispin showed a much nicer badge than we have but you do have a badge we do have a badge that links somebody in order to to allow them you know to register a complaint or get more information about who is regulating this business that they are providing um, c is for a complaint system again i think the ombudsman's structure that is available in England and Wales is probably more robust, but we've certainly create, tried to create a structure where people can register complaints directly with the regulator. And we are also asking 
the providers to report to us complaints that they're receiving. The first D is for data. We talked a lot about data last time, but you know that's just, just this flow of information back. The second D is for disclosures. We're requiring people to utilize certain disclosures around what they're doing. And then the E, which I just added as Crispin was talking, is for ethics because, because it remains the case that people providing these services are subject to the ethical rules of whatever profession they're in, whether that's law or some other structure. Um, I think we have a comment from Kevin. Kevin, please. Okay, I, I actually had a question for Crispin from before and uh, I wanna catch him before it gets too late where <laughs> he is right now. I, I attended a meeting here in California when I was in London a couple of years ago and uh, I was losing it about this point. So I hope I uh, catch you before it gets uh, too long. As you were talking and I, I found your uh, presentation very helpful to understand the uh, extent and scope of the regulatory system in England. But I also had in front of me the first page of the materials for the scope discussion that we're about to begin in. And down in the bottom of the first page, it talks about, uh, it lists a number of the uh, areas where there might be a gap in the justice system. And the first one is eviction proceedings. Now, I'm, I'm aware, at least my understanding is that uh, England and Wales and UK has a more developed social safety net than the United States does. Uh, I'm, perhaps I'm incorrect on that. But I was really curious as to first, uh, are evictions a problem or anticipated to be a major problem in England uh, because of the pandemic? And secondly, if yes, are there any of these regular, uh, I shouldn't say regulatory authorities, but are there any of these uh, ABSs that might be able to provide some sort of comfort uh, representation to the people who might be faced with this? Um, yeah, great question. And one, one that goes you know, to core of why I'm interested in legal services, I guess, because this is the sort of work that we did at the Law Center that I, I used to run. Um, and also, I was director of policy for legal aid, which you remember is a enormous budget compared to, to the US. So when I, I was director of policy, it was 2.4 billion pounds, um, of which a billion was on civil legal aid. Um, we put in place at that point uh, duty lawyers into every single court that deals with evictions in the country, 434 there were. Um, so evictions were dealt with in blocks, not just sprinkled through lists throughout the week. Um, so they would all be heard on, say, a Wednesday morning. And we paid lawyers to be in the court for people that turned up without a lawyer to those evictions. So, you know, that's court and legal aid elements of it. But who does the service, who does the lawyering is predominantly unregulated non-profits like law centers and citizens advice organizations with a mixture of paralegals and regulated lawyers so you know that means that there's they're low cost they're flexible uh, they're expert the research um, shows that the paralegals that specialize in it delivered excellence more often than the lawyers that did this sort of work um, yes, it's a problem. It's going to be a big problem this year. I think like a lot of um, jurisdictions, there's a suspension on evictions at the moment um, and on court proceedings. Um, uh, that's going to be lifted at some point and we'll see a flurry of it. But the combination of a court system that block lists them, a legal aid system that funds lawyers and non-profit flexible models that specialise in this work means that we've got a pretty comprehensive safety net to do our best for sorting that out. Um, but it's not a substitute for building more houses. Okay, all right, thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Tom Green, you're on mute, but it's, you're up. 
Hi, another question for Crispin. I've been actually chatting with lawyers in the United Kingdom and one of the things they like is the changes in the litigation financing system. Can you just riff a little bit on what that, or could you expand on what, what has been done and why lawyers seem to like it? So lots of big things have been done. I wouldn't claim to be an expert on all of them, Tom. Um, but we've got um, we've got a range of um, con- things that will be familiar to to you in some ways. So we have more class action type approaches than we used to have. It used to be almost impossible to bring class actions in the UK. We can do that more, mm-hmm. um, and we have bodies that can make what are called super complaints. Um, So non-profit consumer organisations that can bring um, super complaints into the courts. Um, We have conditional fee agreements and what are called damage based agreements. So where there's no costs. So in our labour courts, for example, there's no no costs regime. You can't recover costs from the other side. But there's a facility Mm -hmm. to strike a deal with customers where it's on usually on a no win no fee basis, but you take a proportion of their damages as a lawyer. And we also have litigation funding now, as I mentioned. Um, So in effect, financial institutions that evaluate your chances of winning a case, and they'll fund either side, defense or or, um, claimant, um, and they will fund it and in effect buy buy the winnings. (laughs) Um, and that suits, you know, really long-term litigation for corporates that they don't want it sitting on their balance sheet year after year after year. They can, you know, they can just quantify it and buy out the risk at a fixed price with a litigation funder. So there's a whole range of different things that happen. Some of our legal aid historically has worked in a similar sort of way. So our, before it was abolished, um, legal aid for divorce was... Um, in effect a loan the government was loaning the money to be paid out of any assets at the end of the, mm-hmm. at the end of the divorce so there's and, a range of different funding methods and crispin with respect to litigation funding my my understanding is that barristers always have to be paid on an hourly basis because of their ethical rules so Not the, anymore. the funding thing is working much more is is really focused on the solicitor it's mainly solicitor it's, it is mainly solicitors that do it, but barristers can now do it. So certainly in personal injury, you will see um, barristers doing um, the advocacy element um, on a no win, no fee as well. Um, in fact, I, I was talking to one earlier that does it. Um, but but solicitors are more set up for it because they tend to have, you know, they're businesses rather than individuals that are practicing. So they have a balance sheet that can absorb and manage risk, whereas an individual self-employed doesn't doesn't really have the balance sheet to take that risk and can't manage the cash flow risks in the same sort of way. So it's less common for barristers to do it. Right. And we obviously have this contingent fee financing system here, particularly for torts. It, 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 it has this, how does our system in terms of its financing compare with this? If at all? Um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Tom. I'd have to go okay. away and your system a Thank bit you. more. Thank you. Let me ask uh, Marta Alkenbrock if she'd like to ask the last question in this portion before we move on. Also, uh, John Lund, uh, does, he can't seem to find the raise hand function, but he's been wanting to comment as well. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Marta. Hi, um, Crispin, thank you so much for sharing all your expertise. My question is actually for John Lund, though. Um, John, you mentioned that you're as part of your uh, work, you're dealing with complaints and um, and evaluating them. And I'm curious what kind of complaints you've encountered and what authority you have in, in dealing with those complaints. Sure, and I didn't have a comment. I was just trying to figure out where the technology was working. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the, um, the, the short answer is we haven't had any complaints yet directly, uh, but we're just a few days in, a few months into the data. Right. You have a structure okay. the case. put in place where if there's a certain percentage of problems slash complaints coming from a particular provider, then if there's a hierarchy there, maybe they're 
maybe they're put into the yellow if it's a certain percentage of complaints, and then they're put into a red if that percentage of complaints gets higher. And our ultimate authority, we, is, and we, do, we just have to do, to do this with somebody around not complaints, but, but turning in data, our ultimate authority is to suspend their license to be doing what they're doing. That's, it's, it's kind of just that basic at this point. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna turn this over to uh, our scope subcommittee to report on your work so far and then to uh, begin the discussion that's going to take us the next hour or so uh, on on your subject. Great. Um, start or do you want me to lead off? Becky, do you want to go ahead or do you want me to? Or we're very deferential, Tom and I. Okay. Um, I'll yeah. start and then you can you can correct me. So <laughs> okay, go for it. The, the Christmas presentation was as is typical of Crispin, enlightening and entertaining at the same time. But it also provided some really helpful concrete illustrations of what this system we will imagine would permit or constrain. And if you, you have before you the, the report from the subcommittee's meeting, which happened um, a week ago or so, and you also have a response that Crispin wrote to the, to the issues list that came out of that subcommittee meeting. Before I summarize that briefly, because I'm not going to read it to you because it is sitting in front of you, I want to amplify something that I think Justice Tucker was a point she made in a, in a separate conversation. Today's goal is not to resolve all these issues. Um, it is to figure out what the issues are and, and set our task for, for responding to them in different ways. So it's not the aspiration here to figure all of this out, but really to figure out what needs to be figured out. One way of thinking about what um, grouping the issues would be to, to think about how some of them are about what is the purpose of this sandbox. So um, the, the issue that Crispin raises in his comment is, is the purpose of it to test out specific innovations, specific activities, or is the purpose of it to test out the regulatory change itself? Um, is the purpose of it to enhance consumer protection or to provide consumer protection? Is the purpose of it to serve some segments of the market or all segments of the market? Because we know that the legal services market is not uniform. That purpose decision has important implications for other issues that come up, which are also raised in both the report from the subcommittee and in Crispin's comments. Is this an open process that has no restrictions on who may apply and participate, or is it importantly structured by some kinds of upfront restrictions? Um, and what its purpose is, is pretty intimately related to that question about, about structuring. I think the, the, then within that, you know, the committee talked about different ways of setting up upfront restrictions, if that's something that you were gonna do. Um, it thought about what can, you know, what are the specific elements of consumer protection? So is that about things like the quality of the service provided, for example? Um, the public comment that we had at the beginning was about protection from, from fraud and from entities that are not regulated in, in the foreseen sandbox. So there was some consideration of that. And Tom, those seem to me to be the big things that came out of that conversation. Um, Tom, I don't know what you want to add, and then of course we can open it up to the rest of the subcommittee who's here. Sure. Yeah, let me just, firstly, let me thank the, the subcommittee. I thought we had a very yeasty and useful discussion um, at our meeting, and I, in fairness, I, I think that we may not have captured every great idea that we heard, so our, our apologies for that, if, if true, but um, I do want to make sure that all of us participate. I do think um, this what is the purpose question is an important one. And I, uh, this is one guy's view, not as a subcommittee chair. And that may well have been what, what Becky was doing as well. But I th think that I, the way I think about this is we need to think about the end at the beginning and that will influence the scope discussion and I think the regulation discussion. And I think the end product here um, should be 
a report of some kind to the bar and to the public and the legislature to the effect that they're, you know, assuming we do this, which is a, obviously a fundamental question to create a sandbox or not, but if we do this, we need to report on what worked and what didn't work. I think that um, particularly the legislature is going to expect us to have protected consumers during this experiment. I think the implication of that at the front end is that we need to ask some questions about who will be served, what is the thing to be provided, is it a good thing? I think fundamentally we need to sort out questions about quality or competence. Um, does this algorithm work? Does this combination of algorithms and lawyers in some fashion create a good product? I think all of those are fair questions to ask at the beginning. And then I think we need to monitor that as part of the sandbox regulatory process to make sure that those perspectives that we learned early on actually have proven to be correct. I think we also need to have the ongoing ability to, you know, pull somebody from uh, the sandbox if, if seems appropriate. I think we also need to have a further discussion because one of Crispin's points was well, was interesting to me. Um, these um, experiments in the UK, um, and this has certainly been supported by the UK lawyers I've spoken to, seems to focus mostly on big law uh, more than anything else really. And specifically to Crispin's point, hasn't done much, if anything, with respect to the low income market, which appears, at least to me, to be where to where to be where the principal gap areas exist. So I think what what are we trying to effectuate here? Who is the the audience, the constituency that we want to assist here? How can we work with legal aid? How can we work with entrepreneurs of whatever stripe to assist in serving that critical market? I think that, you know, my impression is that we need more data on how much of the Main Street market is, is being served or not being served in California at this point. I think Crispin's point that um, it's the micro entrepreneur that are the micro business person that may be best served by some of these innovations. It may well be the case that, you know, a hardware store may already be do, doing just fine. I think we need more information. And to Crispin's point that his impression is that um, things have improved. I think that was a wonderful comment, but I think for us, it would be really helpful if we had data because there is, there are articles, for example, um, there's one from a Stanford group, um, which is to the effect that um, investments in technology in the UK are still much lower than they are here in the United States. So there's, we really need to, a better understanding of how we compare to them and where we, where we need to go. Um, and then specifically, there appears to be, and members of the subcommittee, please correct me here, that there was a list of areas that seem to be particularly acute and we should do some, some thinking about, um, about what that, uh, what the implications of that might be, be and whether, what solutions we might come up with with respect to helping wage an hour thing, you know, uh, kinds of decisions or immigration decisions. It may be that we've got some very specific areas we need to focus on um, in some detail um, in order to get to where we want to go. But those are, those are my uh, perspectives. And of course, we've posed to you um, in the form of this summary, um, the series of questions, what market is to be targeted? Uh, what's the purpose of the sandbox? How should that purpose be reflected in the rules of eligibility? Um, what does consumer protection mean in this context? And I think it, what I heard, I thought in our discussion was that um, there has to be competence and quality in these alternate services. And that's a, that's a big deal. Others have suggested that this, uh, we should let a thousand blossoms bloom and sort of see how it turns out. I, I, I think we need to find a way of, of trying to get a sense of what these new entities might be doing or not doing. And then the other aspect, the kind of the obverse or the other side of that coin is we need to think through 
what, if any, effect, inappropriate effect of inappropriate demands at the front end might have on us, our ability as, a, as an organization to actually run these experiments, to have enough people in or in firms in our sandbox, assuming go in that direction, to get the data we need to um, determine um, whether we should go forward with this in a broader way. So those are my At least for me, Tom cut off at the very end. Um, are there other members of the subcommittee uh, who, who want to chime in here? I think that um, it is important to, for us to hone down on these um, items. I just, you know, circling back to what John had mentioned in terms of having innovation in within the system uh, for financial reasons, I can see that that is actually a plus, not just for like divorce proceedings, but bankruptcies and things like that. And it also assists people who are mathematically challenged or, <laughs> you know, have like, have some anxieties over um, just compiling information and those that have like certain disabilities, which preclude them from being able to do that. And then they have to pay more uh, legal services for that. So when we take into account uh, certain niche groups of people who need assistance, I would like to uh, make sure that the people who are low income do get served in this. And I, I understand that the UK has their um, group is more middle class, but um, we, I would like to have some focus on how we can serve the low, low income people. We're going to have a flood of people who are, have evictions, um, things like that. Um, and California does have, in my personal opinion, this is not statistics, but in my personal opinion, there is like a higher uh, people who have like the, the haves with the higher wages. And then those that are really, low income because of the cost of living here in general. So it is harder for them to earn income. So if we can really um, just help out those that um, are low income or non-native speakers, I would, and people with disabilities, I would be really excited about this program and the platform. Uh, I'm gonna ask, uh, the two co-chairs of the scope committee, if there are other things you want to say or other questions you want to ask or whether you'd like me to now open it up for discussion of the committee as a whole. Tom back. I'm not sure that he is. He's not on my screen. Unless other members of the subcommittee want to place before the larger group issues that they hope the group will keep in mind in the next part of the discussion, I think we're, we're ready to open it up. Okay, well, let me start us then by focusing on the purpose of the sandbox question. And I want to ask um, a sort of a philosophical question and then a very practical and concrete question and would really love to um, elicit thoughts from people in response to both of these. Here's the philosophical question. When you run an experiment, usually a scientist will have a hypothesis that he or she is testing. And so I find myself thinking, what is the hypothesis we are testing? Um, or uh, another way of asking this is, what happens when the sandbox is over in three years or five years? Do we say, we like this new kind of prescriptive uh, regulation that the sandbox has been doing. Let's institutionalize it and let's have a, let's call it a sandbox authority continuing in perpetuity to license in perpetuity uh, these innovative sorts of things. Or do we then revert to a sort of prescriptive system where we say, well, we've had a three or five year experiment. We've decided these things work, these things don't work. Now we're gonna have a set of prescriptive rules uh, that we're gonna revert to. Because I think if we are building a sandbox that is itself a prototype that we intend to institutionalize for the long run, that leads us a different place 
from whether we are experimenting to test certain kinds of ways of relaxing prescriptive rules. So that's my philosophical question. Do people, what do people see coming at the end of our experiment? So we know what, what, we're, what we're road testing through our, through our experiment. And then the practical question for people who prefer to think in the practical terms, we have a prototype here with what Utah has done. And what Utah has done seems to me, I, I think someone used the phrase an open model. It seems to me to uh, allow most kinds of applicants to make an application to be considered on the merits and then so far usually to be accepted. But like common law decision-making, it's up to the deciders to decide, does this one go in or does this one go out? Um, and so my question is, do we want to have a model as open as Utah's or do we want something different? And if we want, if we want something different, what do we want to require? What, what prescriptive rules, if any, do we want to layer on to this open model that Utah has used? And that could be prescriptive rules around we're only relaxing UPL restrictions in, in the first stage, not ownership of entities and fee splitting types, or we only are interested in applications that address certain sectors of the legal market. Or we could say, you know, the only way to get real experimentation in this sandbox is to go with the open version. So let's have an open Utah-like model. And I would really appreciate hearing from people whether they prefer an, a, an open Utah-type model or whether they prefer certain kinds of restrictions, and if so, what kinds of restrictions, or if they don't feel ready to answer that question, what concrete near-term steps do they think would help get them to a position that they were able to answer that question? So that's a long speech, but I'm hoping to help to channel our discussion around the purpose of the sandbox. And I see that Wendy Chang has her hand raised. So I will ask Wendy if she would like to, if Judge Chang would like to address this first. Okay, I will try to address the court's questions. Um, okay, so I, I view that the hypothetical that we're working with is that if we allow this type of innovation in the legal services space, it will in fact result in closing the access to justice gap. I think what that means in terms of what we're, where we're gonna be at the end of it, at some level, it's kind of like releasing a genie from a bottle. It's, I'm not quite sure if this works the way we hope it works, that you can actually put the genie back in, right? Because once it takes hold in the marketplace, and if the people really like the services, I don't think it's really going to matter at, at some point what the regulator wants. At that point in time, it becomes how to facilitate if it works, making it work in a way and keeping it going. So I think, and, and the, I do think you have to offer some type of, um, some type of, um, I don't know, incentive to the people who are going to be innovating and, and expending all this money in developing these types of programs that it's not just going to be arbitrarily pulled in three years. And so at some level, there needs to be some come up, some level of commercial certainty, at least for the people who are able to go through the sandbox in the early times and who, who actually are going through it in a way that um, I guess complies with all the rules we put into place. It may not work at the end of the day as well as we hope to, but it hasn't really caused any harm. It hasn't really done anything bad. So I don't think you want to, you know, say, okay, well, I know you put like four hundred million dollars into that, but oh, sorry, you know, I don't think people are going to do it if that's what the potential that's going to happen at the end of the day. And if we want the best out there, I think we want to develop a program that attracts the best to come into it in the first place. Um, with respect to open model, I mean, I think that's really interesting because I think that depends on, um, from my, my perspective, what we mean by open. At one level, I think that Utah does actually have some um, um, 
structure is in place. They do have prescriptive rules. They have, um, you have to follow the professional rules of the entity. You have to, um, they do have certain rules and they do think that those rules are really, really good. And if companies come in and they can provide a product, I'm not sure we should be in the space of saying, well, you are not talking about eviction. So you, Mr. Company A, you're out of here. Right. Because, again, we go back to we're trying to uh, attract the most innovative and the best out there. And quite frankly, the way I see these types of programs going is sometimes people think and, and they get they get triggered by other people's thinking. And so if one program comes in and the program is dedicated towards something else, somebody else looks at that thing, thinks of, oh, wait, they're going to just go a little bit to the right of it. And now they've created the eviction program we wanted. And so I think that if we, we, and we don't know what that is beforehand. And if we start putting all these artificial walls into place that we're trying to restrict what the innovation is, when we have no idea what's even possible, I think that that's going to be, I think, counterproductive. The one thing though I do want to say is that I would like us to just, and this is from my perspective as being a, a, a trial judge on a civil bench, in terms of what market are we seeking to focus on. I would like very much for us to focus on types of areas of, um, areas of law as opposed to uh, low income, middle income, high income type things. I think that to me that is a little bit of a um, is a little bit of an artificial restriction. If something can help help a middle income person, but also helps a low income person, and it happens to help a bunch of high income people too, I don't see why we would not allow it in the first place. Um, I think it's if if like if a really big corporation like the Amazon of the world comes in and develops a program that will help everybody. Um, I think we should allow them to do that because they have all the money in the world to invest in making that type of a program. In my courtroom, I see people of low income, but I see a lot of people in that middle income space, in the small business space. They earn a, 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 they earn a livable salary. They earn just, they, they're doing just fine. They absolutely have zero dollars to be able to throw it at an attorney. And so they are as closed out of the legal market as anybody else is. And they are facing the same legal um, problems as a lot of other people are. And so, and while the income uh, limitations make a lot of services available to um, people of low income status, that, you know, and it's not great, it's not enough, but there is something, there is nothing available to people in that middle income space. There's very, very little there. And in, 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 the, in the monetary cutoffs for the people in the low income space is really, really low. So there's this really big, huge gap of people who have no ability to access anything that I think I want us to just keep in mind that they are, facing a lot of legal harm too. And I think that if we focus on legal areas as opposed to income levels, we can be addressing both of those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Grunfeld, if you, are you, you are next. Yeah, I am. Um, thank you. Um, let me suggest that we perhaps examine the advisability of kicking the tires on a modified Utah open system, uh, which would basically at the 3000 foot level mean that everybody would be permitted to apply and be considered in terms of innovation and getting permission, but special emphasis and attention um, will be focused on those innovators that will potentially assist uh, individuals and communities who've traditionally been undersolved um, in the legal system. There is in fact, other than the very wealthy individuals and, 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 and business, there is a justice gap, but the justice gap is not equal. And the justice gap, which is at the end of the day, what we are being tasked with dealing with um, is particularly um, difficult 
um, with communities of colors, with low income individuals and so on. So keep the system open, but for those innovations and innovators that are potentially uh, particularly helpful or impactful in those communities, um, they, they, they will be a second look or, or, or a, uh, uh, an openness uh, to pursuing and, and, and approving whatever innovations um, may be in play. Um, the other area where I agree with the judge is that in addition to individuals, um, small businesses should be equally subject um, to such a second review and, and um, an assumption that that's something that we would want to pursue and, and, and have the, uh, the tires kicked um, for all the reasons that the judge uh, articulated and which I um, uh, agree with. Um, at the end of the day, whether we end up sort of giving a close look um, to individuals who are four times the poverty level or five times, or whether we look at businesses that are 50 people or 300 people, that's beyond the scope of today's discussion. But it will give us a scope to, to test various aspects of the marketplace while at the same time focusing on those members of the California community which are particularly impact by the justice gap. Let me stop here. Hey, thank you. I believe, whoops, uh, Bridget, you were next. You just disappeared from my screen. Uh, do you see me? There we go. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. I just actually would echo both comments that we've just heard for the most part. I think based on my experience in the ADELS task force, I spent a lot of time, a couple of years almost, researching this particular aspect. And Based on what I have found in talking to people in other jurisdictions, I think the Utah model of being more open makes sense and less prescriptive from the beginning makes sense. From my conversations with people who have done similar things, it seems to me that the more prescriptive these types of programs have been at the beginning creates more problems down the road. And I, I, I think Crispin has explained, I think it was last time when you were presenting, you were talking about it's really difficult to determine if a, somebody or some entity is going to be unethical at some point down the road on, at, from the entrance standpoint. And so I really like the idea of, and I think Utah has adopted this as well, thinking more about the type of harm that we're worried about and in, in designing a regulatory system that would address that harm um, like through audits and these things that John was mentioning, uh, as opposed to being super prescriptive at the beginning, especially with something like technology where it's like regulators just can't keep up with the new types of things. And I don't wanna start off by being, I mean, my, in my view and what we are recommending through ADELS, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to be um, cutting people off at the beginning when they're trying to innovate as, ju as Judge Chang talked about. Uh, and then I also agree, I, I think it's so helpful. I'm so glad we have Judge Chang here to tell us what she's seeing in her courtroom. She's seeing the people who are not being represented and the, and the problems that that is causing. And so that type of information, I think, is what we should be designing our system around as well. And I agree with Daniel. Um, and this is something I think we put in our report. It's definitely something we talked about a lot when we were putting this sandbox recommendation together. I would really like to think about incentives um, for the, the sandbox applicants to address the particular areas. And we do have this California justice gap survey that they've already done that we can look at. And especially now in light of COVID, I think you know these evictions are one example um, to somehow incentivize innovation around a particular practice area. And like Jud Judge Chang said, as long as people are getting the services, I think that's what's the most important um, as opposed to cutting it off at a particular income level or being concerned about whether a company is making a lot of money off of it or not. I think it's more about are the people getting the services that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten um, thanks to this program. So those are things that we thought about as we were putting this recommendation together and just my opinion having looked at it. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think Eric Helland, you are next. Just a, a small point that one thing that's different about the UK, <clears throat> excuse me, in the United States is, you know, certainly universities in the United States 
much better funded than the UK, large endowments, lots of foundations. So I don't know that we want to think that just because in the UK this mostly, and <clears throat> excuse me, ended up being a middle class phenomenon, you could certainly see a lot of private uh, nonprofit entities using the regulatory sandbox as a way to provide these services we're talking about. So I just, you know, I don't know how that influences our discussion, how we want to integrate nonprofits into this, but that is a big difference between the US and the UK. And there's a much more uh, robust system of legal aid there, uh, which isn't here. And so even if you, you know, foundations would not necessarily be targeting that uh, with their, their sort of giving. So I, I don't quite know where that takes us, but it just struck me in Crispin's presentation that that's one put situation you know, one way in which these might sort of play out differently. We might want to think about, you know, in these areas where we're really concerned about access to justice, how do we facilitate, say, a, a foundation setting something up that would be helpful in some of these areas, you know, in some sense, independent of a, an entrepreneur coming in and finding a lower cost way to provide uh, services like wills or something like that. Okay, I can see we've got a new bullet point that we're adding to the work of the scope committee incentives and support for a particular kind of market uh, of sandbox participant. Toby, I believe you're next. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm somewhere in between uh, on some of the things we've heard. I, I like the idea of saying you know, let lots of flowers bloom, but I'm maybe at 500 instead of a thousand flowers. Uh, I, I was on Adels with, with Bridget and had a lot of those same discussions about incentives and targeting uh, maybe bonus points, if you will, for products and services that aim at the underserved market. Um, I, I think that, that uh, That we we want to make sure. I mean, our, our name is closing the justice gap. It's not how does how do the big four, you know, eat the big the big laws lunch. Uh, not that that's not something that ought to happen for the benefit of society, uh, but I think that's not our focus here. And and um, you know, I would without that, I don't want to get into political discussions, but uh, I, I think that that some method that makes sure that what we accomplish meets that closing the gap goal. And whether it's, I, I, I can agree that it shouldn't be proscriptive. We shouldn't say these are the rules. I like the idea of the audits and, and, and the or open process in that sense. Uh, but I would like to see the selection process. Because I guess I have a, I think I have a concern that we're not gonna have enough money for this process for everybody who would like to be in it to be adequately reviewed, audited, and, and uh, uh, overseen, uh, at least in the short term. And that we ought to focus the resources, because I, I don't see this being a, you know, 50 people in, a, in an office somewhere overseeing this. And I guess that's uh, Sage's function. And we'll talk, you know, talk about that this afternoon. But I think that um, to the extent that the resources may well be limited, uh, we ought to focus those resources where, the, where we feel the most need. And I think the, the name of our task force defines that for us. Thank you. Jim Sandman, you are next. Thank you. On the first question you raised, should the sandbox be temporary or permanent? I wouldn't decide that question now. Uh, I'd be inclined to start with a sandbox for a designated period, say two or three years, and then at the end of that period, review and decide whether the sandbox should be discontinued, extended for another designated period, or made permanent. But let's make the decision based on some experience uh, with it rather than trying to decide it in advance. On the second question, who should be able to enter the sandbox, I'm, I'm with Bridget. Uh, I would prefer an open model uh, in the way that Utah's model is open. And my reason is that innovation, although it might initially be intended for a particular audience or purpose, often has collateral benefits for other audiences and other purposes. It evolves, it adapts, 
and I wouldn't decide in advance that a proposal that was submitted for a population, say, other than the low income population or for a type of work other than uh, the types of cases that um, have the greatest impact on low income populations, that there aren't advantages innovations that could be experienced by low income people and other kinds of why do we want to prejudge that uh, innovation can be a, a, a good thing and can have consequences that no one ever saw at the outset I think there are lots of examples of, of that and I, and I worry about what the criteria would be for prohibiting particular actors or purposes from going into the sandbox on what basis are we going to know the whole purpose of Box is to test innovation in a controlled environment. And I, uh, I, I don't know what evidence we would have to guide our decisions before any testing has been done to prohibit anyone from, uh, from getting near the sandbox. Thank you. Uh, Crispin Passmore, and then we'll go to Patricia after Crispin. Thank you. Very, very briefly. Um, just to clarify, I, I, I think I'm very clear, that, and I think the independent research is clear, that ABSs have improved access to justice. I think my hesitancy is simply it hasn't solved the social problems for the very poorest, but it has helped a bit. Um, it's definitely had an impact on ordinary working people and those micro businesses, the person that is a plumber and works as an independent contractor, etc. A um, couple of other very quick points. We lack tech in the UK. We lack the technology market that you've got in California. It's noticeable that our biggest tech players in the legal market are often from California. I think that gives you a real advantage for the sorts of innovation you'll see. You know, if we had Sanford, we'd be a better place at this sort of stuff as well. Yeah, that just gives, gives you an advantage. To try and close that gap, UK regulators are increasingly working with government to increase the attractiveness of bringing tech into the legal market. They work with an organization called Nesto, which is an innovation organization close to government running things called challenge funds. I can share information about that. Um, on the specific questions, the hypothesis, I would, I would have a little bit of, um, hesitancy about being too absolute about what we're trying to test you know we're not going to close the access justice to access to justice gap but we might help and I think that you know to me the hypothesis is that we help close it um you know let's not think that we've got the one magic wand that is the one solution to it there'll still be access to justice issues whatever we do um because the nature of it changes because you know the nature of, of what counts as justice changes um, as to open or closed, my experience of working with startups over the last couple of years is how often and how quickly they have to pivot as they learn about what works and what doesn't work and what customers want and how something they design for one purpose customers use for something else. And, you know, we see that from everything from technology and legal services through to the origins of Facebook and, and everything else. And if we, if we close it, we stop those pivots if we're not, if we're not careful. Um, big corporates coming in, they often create the new ideas and they spur others on. Um, I think some of the big corporates that I know are interested in developing technology in the legal market that can, they can then deploy separately to help solve access to justice but they fund it by developing it in a commercial environment with big clients and you know that, that's what funds the development of it um, and those big corporates increasingly in the UK I think the big four are interesting on this they train more lawyers and I think they're beginning to really increase diversity in the training of new lawyers um, they're more interested in apprenticeships and taking people younger from more deprived backgrounds and bringing them into law. Um, I think that helps create the focus of lawyers on disadvantaged groups in, in the medium term as well. So I think that's a, a, a positive. Um, and as for the cost of, of this, you know, bring the big ones in and make them pay. And, and you know, whether they're big law firms that want to innovate or, or the big four or the big technology companies, make them pay and make them pay enough to subsidize the sandbox for the nonprofits uh, and, and the smallest businesses, and perhaps even raise money that you use for challenge funds and things like that as well. Yeah, they want to enter the legal market, tax them. Thank you. Patricia Scatiero is next. 
Um, so, so I have several things. Uh, one first, uh, thank you to Judge Chang uh, for providing that perspective on the middle class who does sometimes get like pushed out <laughs> because there's access for low income and then you know the financial with the higher income. So thanks for bringing that up. It's an excellent point. Um, and I do think that we need to serve them as well. Um, Toby, you brought initially brought up cost, and I'm really glad that you did because I was I was thinking um, who's paying for this service. I, that was one of the questions that I wanted to bring up at some point with our group is who's paying for this service. And now that Crispin has added that um, some corporations work together um, and they can subsidize, I'm on board 100% uh, with that taxing them um, to provide some funding because uh, if we we do need to have this funded and you know I have a I have a background in uh, I am a scientist and I have so I have a background in science but I also have been working in the um, industry for software development it's time it's expensive and you do need to have a, a, a sampleation a sample population that's representative in order to get uh, this out to the market. If we have, my only concern, I, I do wanna open this up, but my only concern, and then we have a, a wonderful team of lawyers is if we let big or organizations like Amazon or whoever come in to look at the sandbox, are, is there gonna be some sort of written agreement that they can't just spin off and then just take that intellectual property or those ideas and then start charging a lot and then they're not giving us that much funding. So that would be my question is, um, is, is there sort of like that subsidized housing plan where if somebody buys a piece of property, they have to have it subsidized for X amount of years before they can um, completely fully own it. So that would be something that I would want to have as a safeguard for us is letting these corporations help us pay for this program, but making sure that they can't just do a spin-off and then start charging and then we kind of get pushed out of the way and then we don't have what we need in the end. If I hope that makes sense. It does, thank you. Kevin Moore, you're next. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of a glass half empty kind of guy and uh, I usually go at this and sit with a little bit of skepticism. But what I've heard is uh, there are two issues about incentives. One is to provide the incentives for uh, might be tech people, people who have some great innovative ideas to play in the sandbox. But uh, we had many discussions on this uh, in the uh, ADELS task force. And the general view of the, say, technologists who were involved in that, who were part of that uh, task force, was that don't ask me to participate in this unless I have some guarantees that if I come up with a good, innovative way uh, to uh, deliver legal services uh, reasonably priced, that I can't continue doing that. I mean, give me some assurance that this won't be the end. And one of the recommendations of the ADELS task force was that if you do uh, demonstrate a good means of delivering legal services, whether they be cheap or whatever standard you want to apply to them, uh, then you're going to be able to continue even if the sandbox experiment were to end. In other words, we're going to give you an incentive to make the initial investment uh, in uh, testing out your idea. On the other hand, I, and I stated this in the uh, SCOPE subcommittee, my view is that if we don't move the needle in delivering legal services to those underserved groups and uh, provide legal services in those areas where California has identified a justice gap, this working group will have failed. So I guess what I'm trying, what I'm just pointing out is you want to provide an incentive for both types of things, but what if we end up with the only successful innovation 
uh, it, that results in the sandbox and we've given the assurance that they're going to be able to continue to do it is going to be in high end legal services, but the low end legal services don't really advance. What would happen under those circumstances? Is there some way that we can assure that there will be a balance uh, with the end product of the sandbox? I'm not sure whether I've articulated this very well, but it's been a concern of me, uh, wondering where are the incentives? Uh, you know, the old thing, show me the money. <laughs> Where is the money going to be earned with the delivery of legal services to low income? I'm very pleased to hear the uh, encouragement of nonprofits, perhaps get the big guys to fund some nonprofits and so forth. But we also want to, hopefully we'll get some folks who can develop a way where they will have staying power long after the sandbox is dissolved. Thank you. So thank you. I think one thing that came through loud and clear is the point that we're not going to get to do this or we're not going to have succeeded in doing this if we don't move the needle on access to justice. So that's a good segue for my calling on John Lund, who I understand has something to share. Yeah, I'm really sorry about my yellow hand thing. I don't know what's going on there, but um, and, and I'm sure you probably can all imagine where I stand in terms of whether this should be open or not, but I just want to highlight a couple of pieces. One thing we haven't talked about much in this conversation is like there's a market out there. There's economic forces that, that, are, that we need to be kind of thinking about. And that's why I'm glad Eric's part of our team. One is the Uberization of the practice of law, which is there may be pieces of this that just are outside of anybody's ability to, to figure out how to regulate. So there is a benefit to me in terms of trying these different approaches to regulating legal services, just to be ready when somebody parks those scooters on the sidewalk and says they don't care what the rules are and the market says we wanna have scooters on the sidewalk, which is what happened in Salt Lake City. So that's a sort of a market element of, of sort of where is the demand and the need the other market piece that to me, I, 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 this is a hard one, but you know, who had the first smartphones? The first people that had smartphones were people that had a little extra money, but, but that's, that's the start of that. The, the, it facilitates the development of lots of different apps and lots of different you know, solutions for cellular signals and wireless signals. And, and ultimately now smartphones are not everybody can afford a smartphone, but it's a much broader swath. And, I, and, I, and again, Eric's the economist, but I think what's happening there is we're driving the price point down. Because, and, and when we drive the price point down, we get to where there's more viable amounts of demand for it that, that yield the, the, the market we're, we're, we're kind of going to. So I think that's part, part, those market reasons are why it didn't seem wise to write a prescription at the front end that said, you need, you need to be able to show how this is gonna improve access to justice before we can let you in the sandbox. The other piece, and this is more of a strategy piece, is it is the question we get the most often. Well, what are you doing to make sure that people who are coming in the sandbox have something that is going to indeed improve the access to justice? Because after all, that's the name of your group. That's the point of your, your project. And and not surprisingly, the question we often, the people who ask that question the most are lawyers who are concerned about what this may mean to their economic future. And that's not, a, that's not an insignificant question. So I guess if the committee is, I hope, going to go the route of this more open approach, then I, I think we also need to be really clear about a rationale for that and how it does tie to the ultimate purpose of trying to explore if this will lead to an improvement in the availability and affordability of legal services for everyone. Okay, thank you very much. There was a comment in the chat that I thought might have come from you, John. Uh, yes, it, now your name is on it, that there are at least three nonprofits in the Utah sandbox so far, expungements, medical debt, and domestic violence. Right. And I think that comment is worth lifting up uh, in response to people saying, how, what, what confidence can we have that an open sandbox will address issues of high need? Um, 
Are there others who have not spoken yet who would like to share their thoughts on this first issue before I pose a next question? Seeing no hands yet, uh, the next question is, are there limits on the scope of who can play in the sandbox that we need to consider for consumer protection? Obviously there'll be other kinds of limits and concerns and we, we talked about badges and uh, complaint lines and whatnot, but are there limits on scope that are necessary for consumer protection? One example might be uh, requiring that there be a lawyer in charge of certain kinds of applicants uh, or of the, of the legal um, activities within a certain applicant entity, um, or that if there's a non-lawyer, that that non-lawyer has passed a, uh, a clearing like our moral, what, what, what's, what's it called when you have to, to pass the bar, you have to, the, you have to, pass a moral, yeah, moral character. character. Moral character clearing. Are we gonna say if you're not a lawyer, you have to submit yourself for moral, moral character clearing if you want to run a sandbox entity? For example, I just made that up. Or are we gonna say you have to agree not to uh, have dispute resolution limitations that would require people to litigate outside of California if they have a problem with the service you've provided? Or, um, I just made up two, but there are many others people could think of. The, any comments on the main question of limits on the scope of entrance in order to protect consumers? All right, I saw Bridget, Wendy, Crispin in that order as our first commentators. And then Tom. <laughs> So I think in order, oh, okay, is Bridget going No, no, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I did it wrong. Did, Bridget, you're going first, go. No, okay. Um, I think that um, in terms of making it easier on the actual, the committee itself that's gonna be vetting these, these applicants, I think having a lawyer involved or some sort of service like a peer review group that, that you know, kind of vouches for the fact that it's complying with the ethical rules that whatever we're going to set up as the ethical rules that they need to comply for and the competency of the program in and of itself just as the just as a preliminary matter that's going to kind of weed out a lot of the the really pretty looking programs that actually aren't doing a thing behind the scenes bridget thanks um Yes, I would just add two things to add to that. One, I think Crispin can talk more about it, but I believe it's the model that he used in with the, or it might be Australia, where they have actual um, lawyers and then like a business person who is who is like independently, individually responsible for the particular entities that are in there. So you have some accountability built in. So something like that is something is one thing that we can do. Uh, and the other thing is, and I, I apologize, I don't have it at my fingertips, but in our ADLS report, I believe we talked about a whole list of things that we think would be really important to build in for consumer protection like this. And including like, like you mentioned, like the kinds of um, like jurisdiction limitation, I forget what that clause is called right now, but forum selection clauses or like arbitration clauses, whether they can have arbitration clauses or not, those types of things. Um, including like disability, like what types of, um, you know, they have to comply with the ADA and with certain standards on um, an accessibility to their product. So those are the types of, we had those specific recommendations in our report and I can find them and share them, but I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Crispin. Yeah, I think we've, we've got a lot of these sorts of constraints in, in ABSs in England and Wales. Um, some of which are more effective than others. I think the effective ones are, we have a head of legal practice um, who is a board level lawyer, um, who is the point person for the regulator to contact and, and um, deal with, um, who is responsible uh, legally, so in, in legislation as well as in, in regulatory rules, 
for making sure that the organization understands its ethical obligations as an entity um, and they have to have access to the board. Uh, they are usually a director or sometimes just an owner of the business, but not a director, um, but usually they're on the board. Um, they have to be approved, even if they're a lawyer, they have to be approved as fit to be at that senior level. Uh, similarly, the owners and the managers of the business who are not lawyers have to be fit and proper people. Um, I think the way Arizona has put that into place as well is, is worth looking at. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other, um, not before the event, but ongoing elements of constraint around people. So within our code of conduct for regulated firms, so that applies to traditional law firms and ABSs, is a code of conduct for how the firm must behave. And that has some obligations within it for individual owners and managers as well. So I think there's a there's a whole bunch. I'll try and upload some materials um, if I can work out how to do that um, uh, so that you've got access to some of those codes and some of those bits and pieces as well. That would be wonderful if you could provide some materials and you can actually, uh, if you want, just send them directly to staff and let them deal with the, with the loading up and disseminating. Uh, Tom Green. Hey guys, sorry, I had some technical difficulties there. Um, I think at the front end, um, I think there should be some, maybe some combination of a form or something, but I, I think we should have a conversation with the, the proposed entrance. The first question would be competence. Is this thing that you wanna do going to do what you say it's gonna do? Um, and that could include, does your algorithm actually generate results that are good? Um, I think those are fair kinds of questions. I think that we also want to look at, we may want to adjust this, but for sure, our initial inquiry of um, folks that wanna come in, we should know about their conflicts are they in some fashion going to favor, you know, some other parts of the co company or the corporation? Um, what does that mean? You know, lawyers have a duty of loyalty to their clients. That's something that's important. We should certainly understand that. Um, and then we can make some judgments as to what this entity wants to do and our reactions to it. I think lawyers also have a duty of confidentiality. I think that's something that people expect in, a, in this kind of relationship. Um, I think that's something we need to really focus on. And for sure, I mean, I, you know, one can suggest sort of the iPhone idea that you start with the rich and this whole, tr the, the whole trickle down thing. But I think we definitely need to ask, how is this going to affect the people we know are dramatically underserved in the California market? If they have a trickle down theory, then we should hear it, but we should also hear specifically what they have in mind in terms of serving the people we know are underserved. So there's, that would be at least the front end of this that I would I would suggest. Okay, thank you. I believe I've called on everybody who's put their hand up so far. So I wanna elicit two specific kinds of responses before I get to someone who I see I missed. Thank you, um, Toby. Yes, One so minute. so here are the two things after we hear from Toby that I want to, to ask for in the few minutes we have left. Um, first of all, if the co-chairs of the scope committee have any questions they want to pose to the group. And second of all, if anybody who hasn't spoken on our scope uh, discussion yet has anything they want to share on any of the scope issues. Okay, Toby, please. There we go. Um, just a couple of very quick things. Um, I agree. I think Crispin's description of, of the kinds of, of oversight, I think, sound really good. I'd like to see those. I think the idea of a character and fitness approach is, is critical. Uh, I would not like to see a disbarred lawyer uh, applying as a non-lawyer to offer some of these services or, you know, somebody who's been convicted of fraud or whatever. Um, in, in terms of the uh, kinds of review, we talked about the people, but I think we need to look at uh, the algorithms as well to the extent that's involved. One of the things that I think a lot of, of research has been done on is, is uh, algorithmic bias. And we want to, and, and Adel's discussed this in the report in terms of making sure to the extent we can that, that the, the uh, algorithm isn't 
biased in favor of or against some particular uh, category or group of people or, or outcome. Um, and I guess the only just real quick thing, we talk about the trickle down, I also want to keep in mind, there's also a trickle up theory that, and the, the best example is the curb cut, which was designed to help people with handicaps to be able to access crossing the street. But in fact, having been done that, it, it's trickled up to, you know, parents with children with in, in strollers to suit you know, people with suitcases, businessmen with their wheel of board uh, uh, briefcases, uh, and the, the benefits have gone up rather than, than down in that case. Okay, thank you. Becky, do you want to pose questions for the group? I think I just have one. And it is uh, maybe another purpose question, although it's the purpose of our activity. So is the purpose of our activity to design an ideal regulatory structure that we hope will achieve the goals that we identify for it? Or is the purpose of our activity to design a regulatory structure that could actually be implemented in a concrete place? Um, and if it's the latter, are there other kinds of considerations that have to do with political context, with various groups of stakeholders that we that need to be incorporated into thinking about questions of scope? That is a very important question. Uh, anybody who has any thoughts, but I'm going to privilege anyone who hasn't spoken yet. So if anyone who hasn't spoken yet wants to address Becky's comment, Becky's question, or any of the other comments, I would love to hear from you. All right, seeing no raised hands with that uh, pointed narrowing, I'm going to ask if anybody would like to address Becky's comment. Or let me broaden it a little bit because I do think it's important. We don't want this to be a report that sticks on the shelf. What do we have to do to make sure that what we are proposing is something that can actually get stood up, that it will meet, that it will clear whatever political hurdles there are? Because we know we need the state bar board of directors to approve what we do. We need the Supreme Court to approve what we do. We need the legislature to approve what we do. And all and, and some of those bodies are responsive to different kinds of, uh, you know, political input. So we're looking to devise to devise a system that is excellent, but we're also looking to devise a system that will actually happen. If there are people who want to share comments about process, um, you can add that as well. Toby, you look like you want to say something. And John Lund, I think I saw you wave your hand. I did. I'm sorry, but I, I mean, absolutely, Becky. You know, it, it, there's a lot of strategic issues there. I, I guess it's about those audiences, just as Tuker mentioned. It's about framing this, you know, the right way that it's a test. It's not a permanent change. You know, it's about making sure it's credible with data. I mean, there's a to me that that's that could be a whole conversation about that important question. But it may also go to what the parameters of the of the project are in the first instance. You know, if it feels too unwieldy or too ambitious, or uh, or, or something that just gives people a, an opportunity to to shoot at it, not knowing what it is, but thinking that it could be dangerous, then then that's um, that's a failing on our part. I, I guess a theme that we've tried to think about is incrementalism. You know, it, let let's let's just see what it is that can be done. And, and do that and do that responsibly and safely and and say for another day you know the next the next level or the next chapter that that seems wise to to, to, to uh, open up all right before we bring this morning's conversation to a close any further comments on the scope issues actually I, I do have a question which is, is there anybody on the call that does not think that the basic competency of the, of the candidate should not be considered in allowing them into the sandbox? Can you say a little more what you mean by that if you're asking us to? Sure. Um, 
should is, is it the is it the view of the group as a whole that the ability of the candidate to do what they say they want to do be reviewed as part of the scoping process is there anybody that doesn't think that should be part of the process got it becky i see you have a hand up and then reem i see you have a hand up so i think that's a really important question i think i think it's important to think about a couple of things so one is Imagine all of the crazy, wild, fascinating stuff that people could throw at us. Would a body of 15 people actually have the capacity to assess up front the goodness of those things? Um, so that's an issue about regulatory capacity. The way that, that Utah has thought about this is that's why we, if you're, if you're doing something really weird, that's why your first, there's, a, there's an audit of your first service instances so that, so that, so that we, assess not the competence of the model, but the competence of the service as delivered and received by the consumer. So that you're not doing it up front, you're doing it after the fact, but very early in the in the launch of the service. Okay, that's one. Okay, Reem, can I hear from you? Can we hear from Thank you? Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I just wanted to make some comments regarding the scope. Um, so certainly I think that one area that we should take into consideration too for the applicants that will be applying is the diversity that, they, that they're oh. bringing um, as an entity. So if they are comprised of individuals who are attorneys, you know, uh, MBAs, people with a business background, engineers with an engineering background would be helpful for us because we want to bring in like a diverse um, entity that can bring, you know, this technology solutions to the marketplace. Also, I was considering, you know, if we're really targeting pro se applicants to assist them in their legal matters, potentially the innovations that come from law school graduates, um, graduates from engineering school, uh, could bring a lot of that too. So potentially as part of the diversity for the application process, if they have um, law school graduates or you know recently graduated engineering graduates would be beneficial because they'll bring a lot of innovation to this space. And then lastly, I really um, like the idea that potentially they would share with us the prototype that they hope to bring to market uh, prior to being accepted uh, into the sandbox. I think that would be helpful. So that's all the remarks I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Eric Helland. Um, just, just to your point uh, earlier about, I do wonder if some of these entities will not actually know if they can provide the service that they are suggesting until they've sort of had a chance to try it. There's a lot of tech firms that you know, in some sense, you sort of get your initial round of startup funding. You know, John talked about these things evolving. And so I do worry a little bit that that we want to be open to things that will come in and say, I think I have this really innovative idea, but once I get approval to do this, and so that in some sense, if we require them to prove up front that they can do what they're sort of proving, they may have a difficulty getting funding. They may not have the ability to kind of test the sort of product as it comes to market. So I, I guess my answer to your question is no, I don't know that I want them to have to show up front that they can do it. I do think there needs to be a place moving along that shows that they're not sort of doing harm, the ongoing sort of uh, um, evaluation that, that you know, John was talking about. So I, there's a tension there with how do we sort of encourage innovation where they may very well need to get the approval of the sandbox to get the funding to actually try out uh, the innovations and experiment a little bit. Can I, may I ask a follow-up question? Which well, hold on. No, no okay. I'm actually going to use my prerogative to say you can't because Sorry. we have to start our one o'clock presentation at one o'clock. And I think some of you are going to be very angry with me if I leave you just 10 minutes for lunch. So I have three people with hands raised, Jim Sandman, Mary Baldwin, and Tom Green. You can each have up to 30 seconds if you wish, or you can reserve and we'll take your comments up later this afternoon. Jim. If we're taking a vote, I agree with what Becky said. Thank you. Mary. Uh, I would just say that uh, we've talked a lot about um, various ways to kind of vet and evaluate uh, participants. 
I think that I would err on the side of focusing more on what people are offering as opposed to who is offering it. So I would be opposed oh. in most instances to say a moral character type determination, although I think we can devise some minimum requirements that we, you know, maybe disbarred lawyers shouldn't be involved. That That's pretty straightforward. But I really think I work with a lot of innovative uh, of people who are offering innovations and are, are exploring innovations. And we shouldn't be in the, in the business of trying to limit what, what, who's doing it and what they're doing. I think we should be focusing on what they're gonna be offering and how it fits. So. Thank you. And Tom, you have the last word before we break. So actually a question to Eric, which is, <laughs> uh, should, should we not, uh, do you oppose the idea that we ask these questions about show us show us what you can do. The answer is, we're not sure we can do this. And if in that circumstance, we wanna add some extra layer of you know, review to make sure we're not letting you know, an unknown factor into a market of people's most sensitive kind of operations. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, simply saying, what are you planning to do, right? And if you end up doing something different, please come back and tell us what that is. Uh, and we're, you know, if you sort of deviate too far, it's just that I, I have a feeling proof of concept is going to be hard for a lot of these applicants. Okay, all right. okay thank, Good. You. thank you. Thank you all for a yeasty, productive discussion this morning. Uh, we will be on break until one o'clock when we will be hearing from the paraprofessional task force. See you all then. Thanks. I see our presenters are with us, so that's wonderful. Um, Leah, would you or um, would you like me to give you um, control of the slides, or did you want me to click through them? Uh, I want you to click through them, and just Pat Chu is going to be doing the talking. Okay. Okay, welcome back. We are reconvening the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group. I want to give a warm welcome to our visitors, my friend and colleague, Justice Joanna Petru from the First District Court of Appeal, and my friend and former colleague from back when we were both at Alameda Superior a number of years back, uh, Leah Wilson, who's uh, now, I, I guess, uh, with the bar, and both of them are actively engaged in leading, in fact, the effort of the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. So we look forward to hearing what our companion working group are up to. They are, what, I think about six or eight months ahead of us um, in terms of how far along they are. But I, I think we'll, we'll learn more about that as I turn it over now to Justice Petru. Uh, who is on mute? Sorry, you're on mute, yeah. Okay, so so thank you and welcome and thank you for inviting us today. Um, a couple of uh, prefatory comments. I cannot see because this, the Zoom uh, PowerPoint is up, I can't see the little pictures with everyone else in them. And so I cannot tell, for example, if someone has a question, I would really encourage anyone and everyone to just cut me off and jump in if you have any questions. Uh, we have a pretty comprehensive presentation put together for you, but I don't know which aspects of this would be more of interest or less of interest. And, and you know, we're obviously here to talk about whatever it is that you would find of interest and import for us to talk about. So that's my long-winded way of saying, please interrupt me. I would welcome that. And I know that Leah would as well. Um, Justice Tucker mentioned that we're a few months ahead of you. My understanding is that this group, and I'll explain in a moment why it's my understanding, Mm -hmm. This group commenced in spring of last year, having their first meeting. I think it was around April, May, April, March, April, May in that time zone. Um, I was not involved at the time. I was asked to come in and chair the group at the end of November and took that over basically effective the beginning of December. <clears throat> so what I'm, part of what I'm talking about, I know from firsthand knowledge and part of what I'm talking about is secondhand primarily through Leah. Um, who's been super involved with this from the get-go, which is why I asked her to please be here today. And Leah, I obviously also can't see you, so please jump in whenever. Uh, so why don't we just go ahead and get going uh, to the next slide, please. Okay, so what are we doing? Uh, oh, one last thing. 
as far as where we are in the time frame, so that I don't forget to say this at some later point in time, our deliverable date, our date by which we have we intend to have a comprehensive proposal to the state bar board is September of this year. So it's really uh, not that far away. We're talking about seven months from right now. So what is our charter? We were um, established by the Board of Trustees, Trustees to develop a fully, fully articulated program, nuts to bolts for a paraprofessional program. Everything from what kind of classes would be required, what kind of licensing, to what exactly is the scope of work, to how is discipline done, to things like whether there should be insurance or a bond. I mean, it, it's kind of like setting up an, it's not kind of, it is setting up an entire program parallel to the attorney program. And one way to think about it, which I find uh, helpful is to think about it like setting up a nurse practitioner program as to a doctor program. It's, it's a similar situation. And one thing that I wanted to comment on was that our working groups, I think kind of sprung out from the same thing. It was really from the ATILS, I think it is, the Task Force on Access Through Innovation of Legal Services Report that recommended the creation of your working group and on a separate track, a separate body, our working group to tackle the very specific issue of non-lawyers being licensed to deliver legal services. So let's go ahead to the next slide, please. I'm not gonna spend much time on this. The names are set out on here, but I did just want to share with you, if only briefly, what a fantastic diversity of uh, people and representatives that we have on our committee. We have a very, very diverse uh, group of viewpoints, a very diverse uh, set of backgrounds and perspectives, and really genuine consumer advocacy voices and public um, interest voices and public voices on the working group. So just you know, eyeballing this, you can see we have consumer protection, defense counsel, uh, colleges, law law school, and by the way, we hear from law schools all the time. They give us input all the time on what we're thinking about doing. Public members, I brought on a number of judicial members because when I joined, uh, the only judicial officer was Judge Yu, who was wonderful. But since we are talking so much about what is going to be happening in court and what is going to be happening with the filings of different kinds of cases, I thought it was important to bring on some additional judicial officers from a variety of counties and with a variety of backgrounds. And that's another metric that we tried to use to get diversity on the working group was to make sure to have people from large counties, small counties, rural counties, counties where it's very hard for anyone to get uh, representation. We were just looking at something the other day, you know, it's kind of shocking when you look across the state of California, the number of attorneys per capita varies tremendously from you know, one in 50 in San Francisco on one end to one in many hundreds on the other end. So it's, you know, we're a very big and very diverse state. And so it's hard to come up with proposals that's going to work across the entire thing. Next slide, please. I'm hoping we can come up with a term that's better than triple LT or LLLT because it doesn't exactly trip off the tongue, but that's what we're calling it right now. Um, and what are LLLTs? It's a licensed legal paraprofessional. And what that really actually means is that they can provide legal services, but not under the supervision of an attorney. And that is the big divide from what we currently have. So for example, um, we have paralegals, but paralegals have to function under attorneys. We have legal document preparers, but they cannot um, give legal advice. So really we are looking at creating a group of people who can provide legal services without legal supervision. Again, similar to a physician assistant or nurse practitioner. And what the exact parameters of this non-lawyer law license looks like is exactly what we're charged with developing and what we're trying to do. You can see on the right-hand side of the slide that there are several existing and pending uh, triple LT programs in the country. The Washington program, which was the oldest, was actually recently sunsetted. And we've been looking and trying to understand why that happened. And it seems to us that the cost involved with getting up and running and the low number of triple LTs, probably a related factor, uh, you know, contributed to the court's decision to shut it down. 
But long story short, we've been looking at the triple LT programs that exist that are about to be implemented, try to understand from them um, how we can best put together our own program moving forward. So let's go to the next document and talk a little bit more about what currently exists in California. Uh, because you know, some of you may or may not be familiar with these different groups of professionals. So while we don't have triple LTs, we do have, for example, legal document assistance. And um, a head of the LDAs in California is one of our working group members. They provide self-help services for compensation to individuals who are representing themselves in cases. There are unlawful detainer assistants who give assistance or advice, again, for compensation to self-represented individuals um, who are involved in an unlawful detainer action, either side of it, either the prosecution or defense of it. An immigration consultant is someone who gives non-legal advice or assistance on an immigration matter. I think we all are familiar with paralegals. Um, it's someone who holds themselves out to be a paralegal, qualified by education, training, or work experience, and who either contracts with or is employed by an attorney, law firm, governmental agency, et cetera. The bottom line, the paralegals are performing substantial work, but it is always under the direction and supervision of an attorney. None of these types of uh, professionals are regulated by the state bar, none of them. The LDAs, the legal document assistants, and the unlawful detainer assistants are required to register in the counties in which they operate. And we do not have statewide data available on their prevalence, complaint rates, what they charge. There simply is not a statewide database for any of that information, which has been a little frustrating, honestly, as we try to work through this. Uh, immigration consultants are required to register with the California Secretary of State. Uh, there is no registration requirements of any kind that we're aware of in regards to paralegals, you know, perhaps because they do work under the supervision of an attorney. I mentioned we have a representative of the California Legal Document Assistance Association on our group, which has been great and has really helped me understand what kind of functions they perform and what could be an appropriate scope of practice for triple LTs. Okay, let's move on. So what have we been doing for the last however many months we've been doing this? Um, we've been doing a lot. I have to tell you that with the September deadline, um, we have a number of subcommittees and there are committee meetings in our group multiple times a week, every week. Um, all the subcommittees are extremely active. And then every couple of months, we have a full working group, you know, full day, about 10 to four meeting. But given the uh, difficulty and scope of the project that we're undertaking, it's just requiring a lot of work to meet the September deadline, which I do think we are going to be able to meet. So here's the high level, and then we're gonna go through uh, each of these topics. Practice area and task selection, the initial framework for licensing, discipline, regulation, and governance, the rules of professional conduct. How do we evaluate things? And I'll talk about the fact that we're looking at uh, implementing a pilot program. And, and again, initial implementation, which would be the pilot program. So let's start drilling down and go to the next slide on practice area and task selection. So how have we decided what to include in the you know, enormous universe of things that attorneys do and, and legal help that is needed? Really where we started was with the justice gap study from 2019 was a very, very important um, source document for us. And we also reviewed the recent California attorney practice analysis, um, a state bar uh, report outlining veterans legal services needs, a report authored by the Code of America on the legal needs associated with record clearance, uh, the Shriver Council project, uh, the JBSIS data from individual courts. And that data, which is not complete and not everything is required to be reported, but that data gives us ideas about relative volume of filings by case type, court self-help data, and also a CALDA survey about the legal document assistance uh, practice area frequency. We were really uh, 
you know, we took to heart the recommendations from the ATILS to not be too restrictive in the number of practice areas. And so we really have gone through area by area, detail by detail in order to try to understand what would make sense going forward. So let me um, talk a little bit more about practice area selection. If we go to the next slide, please. So aside from reviewing all the reports that I just very briefly mentioned, we have met with a lot of subject matter experts, a lot of judges, a lot of practitioners, and done in-depth reviews of every single case type and the processes here. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, we have a number of judicial officers uh, as part of the working group now who are involved with the day-to-day -day review that's going on. So all of this development, all of this work helped us to develop a list of practice areas that we've identified for exclusion or inclusion that I'm going to go ahead and cover for you in the next few slides with the caveat that these are tentative lists. These are works in progress and uh, I think they will largely wind up close to where they are right now, but these have not been finalized and approved. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Oh, and my slides seem to be out of order then. Oh, okay. Um, so it's easier to start with what we're going to exclude rather than what we're going to include, right? So exclude other than collateral criminal, which we'll talk about in just a moment is criminal. I, I mean, we can talk about why that is, but I think you can guess. Uh, estates and trusts, we had a lot of feedback that because of the level of complexity in there that we may not want to have the triple LTs involved with that. Um, immigration typically is a federal matter and veterans issues as well. So let's look at what we've decided to, or at least tentatively, again, I need to continue to make the caveat, tentatively decided to include, if we could go to the next slide, please. For collateral criminal, um, we have decided to include expungements and reclassification of convictions. Those seemed like very appropriate uh, tasks for triple LTs that people need help with and should not have to retain an attorney to get it done. For consumer debt, we are looking at uh, creditor harassment cases, wage garnishment, and utility cutoff due to non-payment or due to billing disputes. And then in employment, uh, the only areas that we are considering at this point are unemployment benefits and wage and hour claims. All other areas of employment law like harassment claims, discrimination claims um, have been ruled out for program inclusion. Let's go to the next slide, please. Family, um, you know, we have gone, and, and I have to tell you, when we go through these subject matters, for family, for example, we have a multi-page document, you know, single spaced with every line being very specific tasks, like here's what you do for a dissolution. Here's every single task that happens underneath that. What would be appropriate for a triple LT or not? So for family, we are contemplating including uh, dissolution cases, including support, division of assets and debts, custody and visitation, responding to protective services investigations, violence prevention, such as uh, domestic violence restraining orders. And we're talking about conservatorship and guardianship. I think you all appreciate and know that family is one of those areas that has an astronomically high percentage of self-represented litigants. And also that when, uh, and, and it's very document heavy and the documents can be really confusing. But a lot of times if someone can get help with the documents and with the basics, they can actually move their case through and get it done. So there is you know, simply an enormous need for some assistance in this area. In regards to general civil, we have are tentatively including enforcement of judgment and debt collection representing the debtor and enforcement of small claims court judgments. Let's go on to other uh, subject matters in the next slide. For health, we're looking at medical billing and denial of access to services. Housing, unlawful detainer, of course, unlawful detainer is another area where there is an enormous need for people to be able to get some help short of having to hire an attorney and title clearing. 
Um, income maintenance, uh, I just wanted to note, you know, it says administrative agency proceedings. I'd like to note that this includes public benefits. And so things, um, and we are contemplating allowing um, advocacy in the administrative agency proceedings. A quick side note, there's a general hot topic in our working group in regards to whether uh, Triple LT should be allowed to actually appear in court, like sit at council table and speak to the judge. And that is not something that has been decided. That is something that is under discussion. And then finally, uh, name and gender change. Again, an area where really what matters is understanding how to fill out these forms, how to get in the court and how to get it done. So let's go to the next slide so I can give you a little bit of a better idea of what we look at. So I mentioned to you um, that we go task by task. And so I just wanted to give you one example of the kind of detail that we're looking at. So this is in collateral criminal. And we're talking about, for example, on the left-hand side, uh, Prop 47 reductions, expungements. And here are the specific tasks that they would be doing and allowed to do. Prepare the order, determine if a record clearance is needed, file the petition and get a court date, get it served on the DA, appear in court if necessary, get a copy of the order and send it to the Department of Justice, right? So those are, those are the steps that one has to take to get an expungement or reduction done. Um, similarly with infractions, I'm not gonna you know, sit here and read a slide to you, but I just wanted to give you an example. Like if we said, you know, we recommend a triple LT be allowed to do expungements, that would be with a chart that shows what exactly that would be. And that would be the case for every kind of task that we recommend they be allowed to do in every single subject area. So on to the next slide, please. So at the same time that we've been doing a tremendous amount of work in order to finalize the practice area recommendations, and we really are getting close to finalizing those, we've also been working on figuring out the overall program structure and framework for implementation. Um, in many areas, but not all, this will be in alignment with the parallel practices that are in place for attorneys. But there's some key points of divergence that I'm going to hope that I remember to call out and point out to you as we go over the current recommendations in these various areas. We can go ahead and go to the licensing slide, please. Okay. So there, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of discussion about this. And what we are currently contemplating is that in order to be eligible to seek licensing as a triple LT and understand that when one gets licensed, it wouldn't be, I am a licensed triple LT. It would be specific to what you're doing. So it would be, I am a licensed family law triple LT. I am a licensed unlawful detainer prior professional. So we're not looking um, different from here's your law degree, you've passed the bar, go do anything in any area of law. We're looking at licensing people specific to subject matter area so that we can provide the education for that and really hopefully provide a great service to the public. So eligibility, either a JD, a JD or LLM um, from an ABA approved California accredited or registered law school or a paralegal that's qualified under the business and professions code. So you must either be a JD or LLM or be a paralegal. And then you are required to have education, ethics and professional response. These are the ones that are for everyone. Um, ethics and professional, well, not necessarily everyone because we're still debating court procedure and advocacy depending on what they're doing. Everyone will be required to have ethics and professional responsibility. That I can tell you without question. Then there's evidence, court procedure, court advocacy, and specific requirements that are being put together for each specific subject matter area, of course, tied into what tasks would they be doing. Um, we're contemplating 1,000 hours over at least six months in the intended practice area of working underneath um, the supervision of an attorney. And one thing I wanted to mention is we are talking about being able to test out of certain things. So for example, I believe we're going to most likely require everyone to take ethics, but let's say someone just got their JD and took evidence last year. We're going to let them take a test administered by the state bar on evidence and not have to actually take the course. 
So we most likely will be allowing um, or recommending that there be an, an ability to test out of certain education requirements. Again, with the idea of we need to get people actually out there. If someone is starting from scratch and if someone is having to take all of the courses and testing and do the thousand hours of experience, it's probably about 18 months from start to finish in order to get your license. And so we are contemplating ways to get people out quicker without reducing the quality of, of the folks, whether that's testing out of having to take certain courses or potentially, this is a matter of discussion right now, if for example, let's say we have a paralegal who's been working in a family law law firm for the last 10 years, potentially we would uh, be amenable to having the supervising attorney execute the appropriate declaration that the paralegal already has a thousand hours in the intended practice area and doesn't then have to go do it again. And so we can get those folks out. So these are you know, the things that are under discussion. And of course, moral character, including fingerprinting and a background check. Um, let's see if I'm missing anything on this one. No, I mean, you know, I think we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. And Leah, obviously feel free to jump in here at any point. Okay, regulation. This is under discussion. Financial responsibility, whether there should be a surety bond, a security, excuse me, a client security fund or restitution fund. Um, rules of professional conduct will be aligned with the rules for attorneys. Risk-based regulation will have annual reporting requirements and desk audits. You know, one thing that we've talked about a lot is financial responsibility and the working group has recently approved the two forms that we put at the top, surety bond and client security fund restitution fund. And we were really fortunate to have the assistance of the state bars office of professional competence in doing this work. Uh, it, just extremely helpful. One thing that came up was there was some desire to have malpractice, but of course we don't require malpractice assurance for attorneys and ultimately decided that we were not going to recommend that it be required for paraprofessionals. And as far as the annual reporting requirements, we're thinking about things like fees, case type, number of clients served, and desk audits would be practice audits as part of an overall regulatory scheme for licensed paraprofessionals. These things are not in place for attorneys. I mean, no question, we do not make attorneys do this but we have been trying to study and understand what other jurisdictions are doing. And it seems to be quite helpful elsewhere. And we do understand that the board is considering proactive regulation for attorneys pursuant to the work of the 2020 Governance in the Public Interest Task Force. Um, and I think that your working group is also going to be focusing on proactive regulation as you develop requirements for sandbox participation. I don't know, I think you might be. Um, but I wanted to, but for that reason, I wanted to let you know that we're certainly contemplating doing that for the paraprofessional program. Okay, next slide. So on the rules of professional conduct, we've been um, assisted by the same staff that has been key to supporting your working group in our effort to build out a complete set of paraprofessional rules of professional conduct. We're going to consider these rules at our April and June meetings and then circulate them for public comment, uh, hopefully in the summer, with the goal being that in September we can present to the board a fully vetted set of rule proposals. So on these rules of professional conduct, I mean, you know, again, I don't want to read slides to you, but uh, we have set forth various topics and I'm going to um, ask, actually, is Randy D available because I can't see anyone? I'm here. Oh, hi, Randy. Could hi. you give an overview of some of the key rule issues that we're addressing as well as flags the potential overlap with the working group? Sure. And, and so the uh, rules of uh, professional conduct apply to lawyers. And so with the uh, working group on power professionals, um, they will not be quote unquote lawyers. And so they will need to have their own standards of professional conduct. In the sandbox, there might be applicants uh, who are not lawyers who also might need to be governed by certain standards of conduct. And what you have on the screen right now 
are some of the issues that uh, the Office of Professional Competence staff has been looking at with the working group with regards to how can you actually adapt the attorney rules for persons who are not attorneys. And so on the surface, it might seem pretty simple. Well, in the case of CTJG, we're gonna relax UPL, we're gonna relax fee sharing non-lawyer ownership and just say all the other rules apply, but not so fast, it's not that easy. And so what you see in some of the issues is the group that's a little bit ahead of the game on us, the power professionals group is already looking at these. So I'll just touch on them really briefly because this is not supposed to be a substantive rules discussion. But first one on the bullet there with regard to financial arrangements uh, with clients is contingency fees. Uh, the rules, uh, California rules prohibit unconscionable fees, the ABA rules prohibit unreasonable fees. A contingency fee gives you a percentage of recovery that in some cases could be considered a windfall. And the rationale is that the provider of the legal service assumes risk of non-recovery. And so what might be a higher fee than normal is justified. But if either the applicant to the sandbox or the power professional is not assuming the same type of risk that a lawyer is assuming, then is the concept of a contingency fee even applicable in that situation? Um, advance fees. Uh, advance fees are permitted, but they are a risk factor for lawyers. In fact, in statute, there are things that are outright prohibited. You can't take an advance fee for loan modification by statute, can't take an advance fee for immigration reform that hasn't happened yet. Those are things prohibited by statute. And lawyers for many years were allowed to place an advance fee in either their trust account or their general account. Uh, but with the rules that became operative in 2018, um, you are required to put it in the trust account. But again, is the activities of a paraprofessional or of an applicant to the sandbox gonna be such that a fee paid in advance of the services rendered is necessary for the sustainability of, of that new delivery system? It's not clear. And if there is advance fees allowed, would the restrictions now imposed on lawyers in terms of put it in the trust account or get consent from the client to put it somewhere else, would that be applicable as well? Uh, gifts from clients. And the best example of that is when you have a testamentary gift. Um, I think there's been talk about uh, potential estate planning tasks as being tasked for both paraprofessionals as well as maybe even technological applicants to the sandbox. Um, to what extent uh, would uh, the provider, whether it's in the sandbox or the paraprofessional, might consider giving a gift to the person who prepared uh, the document? Uh, there are statutes that govern that and restrictions, the rules. Um, again, a lot of things in the weeds that need to be sorted out before you can just uh, wholesale adapt these rules. Business transactions with clients includes acquiring any adverse pecuniary interest, the classic one being securing fees, securing fees through, say, a, a noted deed of trust. Lawyers have to jump through hoops to do that. Power professionals, do they need that or should it be absolutely banned? Uh, I'll go quickly unless you want to just spot check. Maybe I'll just take one bullet from the remaining ones. Uh, in the second row, financial arrangements with other paraprofessionals, authority to form firms. That's an interesting one because uh, lawyers for a long time uh, were very restricted on the business uh, format that they could use. And then there were law corporations and then there were limited liability partnerships. These were viewed as largely business interests for these uh, providers because if you have a law corp or limited liability partnership, you know, you do have the protection of limited liability for non-professional liability issues. You have certain organizational advantages, maybe even some tax considerations, but that was viewed as uh, an evolving necessity for the profession of law. Is it something that we're going to have to face with uh, paraprofessionals? We're already seeing it when, I, when we discussed sandbox applicants in terms of co-equity ownership of the new delivery system that's permitted to practice in the sandbox. But the law corporation statute actually says that the law corporation itself must abide by all the professional standards of a lawyer to the same extent as a lawyer. And so if we do allow these banding together to form quote unquote firms, are we gonna have something like that in place as well? 
Uh, referral fees, uh, referral fees with other professionals, referral fees among the paraprofessionals. In California for lawyers, we've had something that's different from the ABA model rules in terms of allowing the so-called pure or bare naked referral fee. And so under the ABA rules, in order to share fees to make a referral, you either have to assume commensurate responsibility or division of labor. But in California, there's Supreme Court case law that says you can pay a referral fee without uh, any of those as long as you go through the hoops. Uh, should that type of very uh, flexible open referral fee arrangement be allowed in this context of paraprofessionals or a sandbox? Lastly, advertising. The advertising rules, California were recently revised with the comprehensive revision, but on the heels of that, the ABA went again and revised the rules and streamlined them, uh, in part because they felt that detailed advertising rules were potentially interfering with the mode in which clients, consumers today are getting information. They're getting information through social media, through search engines. They're not getting it through a newspaper ad. And so should the rules be simplified in order to not impair those communications methods, because if you can't get information from lawyers, how are you ever going to get legal services from them? And so that same issue touches and concerns the paraprofessionals. Uh, you wouldn't want those same types of limitations. The current lawyer referral statutes only apply to referring lawyers, but you could uh, expand them to include referrals for paraprofessionals. And so in quick, <laughs> Form, I think I've hopefully made the point that the professional conduct part of this equation, you know, superficially might seem simple, just to use the same lawyer, law, rules that lawyers use, but it can be very tricky and it will take a lot of attention, detailed review to, to get to the end point for these. Thank you so much. Okay, so with that, um, can we go ahead and move on to the discipline slide? So as I mentioned, we're somewhat in parallel. And as Randy was just talking about in regards to the prior slide, there's some areas where you know it makes sense to mirror and then others where it does not. And you really have to drill down and think about it. So in regards to discipline, we've set forth what we are thinking about in regards to the disciplinary structure, which would be um, intake investigation and charging by OCTC. And then a significant difference, the initial hearing would be by a hearing panel, not the state bar. And the hearing panel would be made up of a staff adjudicator, a licensee, and a public member. And then the appeal would go to the hearing panel or a licensing board. Uh, the reason that we're thinking about recommending doing this is it's a less formal and intense process, which should be sufficient for paraprofessional discipline and should be faster as well and also allows for a pair of professional to be included as part of the adjudicative process. We've had a, quite a bit of conversation about what should be included in the public record and are currently leaning towards formal discipline, diversion, uh, citation, and fine, and we're discussing how long they should be public and what the disciplinary standards would be and what disciplinary standards would equate with revocation, suspension, uh, citation and fine or diversion. And there too, the citation and fine is different than what exists in the attorney world. So we would be expanding that out a little bit and doing a process that's a little bit less formal and quicker with um, hopefully some more flexibility to it that's more appropriate to this program. Okay, next slide, please. Pilot, when I joined the group back um, at the end of the year, uh, there had not been, there was, I believe some discussion about a pilot, but no pilot subcommittee set up. And we went ahead and set that up pretty quickly because it's, I, I, it's my personal view that it's very important that we try to decide sooner rather than later if we're rolling this out as a pilot and if so, what does that mean? Because that helps inform our work between now and the summer. So we've had a lot of conversations about this. It has not been brought to the full working group yet. It will be one week from now. And what we are talking about when we mean pilot is not um, a limited duration in the sense of we do not want to set up a program as has happened in other places where we say, we're going to have a paraprofessional program and it's going to sunset in two years unless something else happens. We feel that that would really be an enormous disincentive for people to become paraprofessionals, which has been an issue in various places. 
for law schools or community colleges or wherever we're setting up some of these educational requirements for them to partner with us and set up the programs if they're concerned that they're just shutting them down in a year or two. And also to have adequate data, you know, you can't get good information based on the first 12 months of a program being rolled out. So we're not, so I just want to be very clear that when we talk about pilot, we're not talking about only for a certain period of time and then the program goes poof. What we're talking about is limiting it, limiting it to certain practice areas, potentially certain tasks and certain geographic uh, regions. And also we have an interest in doing this so that we can start getting some feedback and help us to ensure public protection as we roll it out more fully. The areas, we're not gonna to get too far into it, um, but I mean, I'll just say that the areas that we're contemplating right now for a pilot rollout would be, um, Leah, correct me if I'm wrong, family unlawful detainer and collateral criminal. Right, I think it's housing. Housing, yeah. Family housing, which will be primarily unlawful detainer um, and a collateral criminal. And Leah's done a lot of work recently to help us sort out what the geographic areas would be. And we're certainly, certainly, we're at this time contemplating certain counties within Southern California, Central and Northern, focusing on where is there the greatest need, um, where are there programs that we can work with, it, it, just a number of metrics to help us identify. But as I said, this is a work in progress. It's going to the full working group next Friday. If I had to guess right now, I would guess that we were going to roll this out in two or three subject matter areas with limited geography, but not a limited duration. All right, next, and then we'll roll it out into the other ones. We'll figure out the time frame for that. And then governance and program evaluation. So lastly, we've begun to develop recommendations regarding the overall program governance model, as well as the metrics by which the success of the program can be measured. We are more in the initial phase of work on these, and these are just preliminary recommendations. We are um, contemplating having a board comprised of 13 members, five licensees, two attorneys, and six public appointed by the State Bar Board of Trustees or their appointing authorities. And, you know, it's always very difficult to decide what are the metrics? How are we going to see if this is working? Is it some way to see if there's reducing the justice gap? Is that a reduction in the number of self-represented litigants? Is that getting the same service for less money? Is it the amount of time it takes you to actually get through court once you're there? Can you get through and get your name changed on one go rather than four because you have problems with your paperwork? We are um, not as far along in this as we are with some other things, but we're moving right ahead. And then speaking of moving right ahead, if we could go to the next slide, which talks about our roadmap. This is what we're looking at doing kind of month to month between now and the fall in order to get the recommendation to the board by September of this year. Um, so if we look at January, we just went through, we just finished up a review of subtasks and subtopics and program structure. Later this month, next Friday, we plan on taking votes on subcommittee recommendations regarding the following uh, practice areas, family, children, and custody and also on recommendations regarding licensing, regulation, and discipline. As I nodded to earlier, we have a discussion ongoing about in-court representation, and part of our meeting next Friday will be a facilitated discussion regarding that important issue. We'll also be setting forth the initial recommendations from the pilot uh, group subcommittee and talking about proactive regulation. Then, of course, a lot happens between February and April. There are multiple subcommittee meetings a week, but our next full working group meeting is in April. And at that point, we plan on voting on recommendations regarding conservatorship and guardianship, consumer debt and general civil, employment, health, housing, and talk about uh, the rules and statutes. Next slide, please. June, we would like to review and vote on proposals regarding the rules and governance structure. July, we'd like to finalize our draft recommendations. Um, I think we're familiar with the concept of a soft opening for a restaurant. So Leah, can you talk about our soft opening over the summer for our program? 
Sure. Um, we uh, hope and plan and intend to be in a position to send out uh, for public comment the entirety of the proposal. So uh, the practice areas that will be recommended for inclusion, um, a set of uh, potential rule proposals, the licensing regulation and discipline uh, proposed structure, the governing body structure, and the plan for the pilot rollout so that we can then uh, present to the board in our final product in September, not just the recommendations from the working group, uh, but also an analysis of public comment received. And in fact, the working group may decide to modify their recommendations based on that public comment received. This is a process that the ADELS uh, phase one, your predecessor working group used, I think to great effect. It allowed the board to then take immediate action upon receiving the final adults report and that is our hope here as well that the board will be able to move quickly uh, because the need as we all know is great uh, and certainly once these some of these covid protections expire in the housing area the need is going to be even greater so that's our, our soft launch over the summer and leah was there anything you wanted to um add in from the earlier parts of the overview no i thought you did a great job okay well, I think we can then shut the slides down so that I can actually see who's here. <laughs> okay, and we've got a little bit of time, I believe, right, Madam Chair? We do, absolutely. And I see Patricia, were you raising your hand? Thank you. Um, I think the slides look great. I think the concepts are look they're very promising. The one thing that I'm very concerned with is that the immigration consultant um, aspect was left out of this program. And the reason being, and I did this, I honestly did. I woke up on a Saturday and I decided I wanted to be an immigration consultant. I wanted to walk through this process. That's what I did. I got up, I went at, to the UPS store, had my photo taken, I had my fingerprints done. Um, and then I emailed for a surety bond, filled out the application. I didn't send it in and I didn't pay for the surety bond. I just, you know, I just wanted to see what the process was. Right. The process was, was so easy um, that it didn't require me to have even the standard of training that a notary requires for education levels and things like that. So I could have been anybody and, you know, just as long as I pass a background check, I can have that uh, title as immigration consultant. And that to me, it was it, it's, it's a little distressing because I've seen a lot of people being taken advantage. I don't have like the actual numbers, but there are people being taken advantage by immigration consultants. And if they're in, if their status is iffy or they're underdocumented, are they really, how many of those people are really going to stand up to the immigration consultant and make a complaint? May, likely they're not um, uh, English speaking, they're non native English speaking. And also, uh, I would be afraid that immigration was, would end up at my doorstep if I complained about the immigration consultant that knows my address. So that's why I was kind of hoping that within this. Um, professional group, there could be some standards of education that they too have to go okay, through. Okay, so I'm going to, and Patricia, I, I completely hear you, and I, you know, I just want to comment before, I'm going to actually ask Leah to respond to this question, because this was, you know, I'm going to ask Leah to respond, but before I do that, I wanted to just say that I completely hear your concerns, and the concerns are similar to what we come across um, for various practice areas. So for example, one of the people that we've spoken to is the person in the district attorney's office in Los Angeles, who is responsible for uh, handling the notary fraud cases, because there are many people who are taken advantage of by people who you know, purport to be or maybe notaries, but represent that they can actually do a lot more than notaries are allowed to do in California. And uh, often are people for whom English is not a first language or not familiar with our system, you know, all the issues that you just raised. But Leah, specific to immigration. Yeah, I think it's a, a great point. 
I would encourage you to submit a public comment to that effect, comment to that effect when these proposals go out for comment. Because what I would say is immigration consultants is a very charged issue uh, in Sacramento, a very political issue. And there was a lot of debate around inclusion of immigration at all in this program. And I think we we erred on, on the side of not including it because there were um, significant concerns about uh, the potential quality of the paraprofessionals in the immigration space. Although what you raise, I think, is a commonly um, accepted view of immigration consultants and their lack of regulation, um, there, there was frankly a concern about us trying to take that on, at least in this first pass of the program. I would say something similar has been raised as well, uh, similar has been raised as well with respect to legal document assistants um, who are also not regulated in any real sense of the word. Um, but at this time, we are not making recommendations with regard to that class of professionals either. Uh, but I do encourage comment to that effect because I think in the long run, it does make sense to bring all of these legal related professionals under some kind of uh, similar regulatory umbrella. Okay, so the comment was made in May of last year um, in an open forum. So there is documentation that that concern was posed um, by several members, including myself as a public member. Um, but, and so my understanding that, that this would be, and I haven't had a chance to attend all of the other her professional meetings. So that could have been part of like my bad, but um, my understanding was that from last year's session, that this would have been included. So just for the record, I wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Right, and, and for the, you know, and, and speaking of for the record, I think that's why Leah's encouraging you that when an actual proposal goes out this summer for comment that you take advantage of that. Thank you. Do we have other questions? I see Jim Stanman has his hand. Jim, on. yeah. Thank you for the excellent presentation. I have uh, two related questions on how you identified the list of tasks that licensed paraprofessionals will be permitted to perform. Did you attempt to determine whether those tasks are sufficient to make a difference in outcome for clients? Will they be better? Are they enough uh, to, to make a difference for people who otherwise might be on their own? And related to that, but a little different, do you have any sense of the extent to which the market of paraprofessionals you're trying to attract will look at those tasks and say, yes, that's worth, those things are, are significant enough uh, that it's worth going through the licensing and the practice requirements to, to get the credential? Or might they look at them and say, that, that's not enough. I, I, I can't make a living on that. I don't perceive that there will be a market for those services. Yeah, I mean, part of, you know, when you talk about a market for services, you're starting with the concept of, is there a need, right? And so where we started from was, where is there a need? And so nothing that we're putting on our board as being a topic for a paraprofessional uh, specialization, everything that we're talking about, there is a very significant need. We have you know, reviewed many, um, many studies. We've talked with many professionals. There is a need, which to my mind means there is a market. Uh, now, not everyone will be able to pay whatever the paraprofessional is charging, which will be, I'm sure, significantly lower than an attorney. That's another subject that's an open topic right now is whether there should be fee caps on uh, paraprofessionals. And so that's something else that we are discussing. And then I believe you also asked the question of, are the tasks adequate? Well, my short answer is yes. We're talking about, can you do a dissolution? These are the steps that you'd have to do. If we're looking at a subject and we say they can only do two out of the 10, we would never approve that subject as an area for paraprofessional work because kind of, what's the point, right? Um, so I think my short answer to you is yes, understanding that, of course, I don't have a crystal ball about how this is going to go out, but we've been working very hard about trying to understand where the need is, therefore the market is there, can a paraprofessional, do we feel like it's in the interest of the public for a paraprofessional to take on this kind of work? And for example, and sometimes the answer is no, right? Like one thing that you didn't see on the list for family was contempt hearings. 
there's a lot of complications around contempt hearings. And there's a lot that probably is not appropriate for someone who hasn't gone through law school. We're not going to say um, paraprofessionals should be doing um, employment discrimination uh, jury trials. You know, I mean, we're, we're really trying to focus on areas of very high need. And let's face it, that's why most people go to court. Okay, most people don't go to court because they have an intellectual property dispute going on. Most people go to court because they need a civil harassment order. They're, they are having a family dissolution. They're having uh, problems with uh, some kind of medical debt. This is the bread and butter of why people need to go to court. And a lot of that is work that, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna offend any attorneys on the call. You don't need three years of law school to be able to do and do well. And I'm actually quite confident that providing people with very specific training to the specific tasks that they're supposed to do will help. Um, I attended, I'm so sorry, I can't remember her name. I attended a uh, talk sponsored by Berkeley Law by a woman who's an international expert in these paraprofessional type programs. Uh, did you attend that one, Leah? Yeah, and I think he's the first vice chair of this working group. Is she? Is she here? Yes, she is. And I, yeah, she's Where here. Is she? She's she's famous and she's here. It says Rebecca. I'm here. She says Rebecca on her. So Rebecca, that was awesome, first of all. And secondly, I'm sure that you've shared with your group some of the stuff that I found so interesting about kind of the satisfaction rates or when people were saying, um, you know, the error rate, which if I recall what you said, but let, well, let's see how carefully I listened to you. I recall you're saying that the error rate between the attorneys and paraprofessionals was quite similar, like something like 25%. And that the number of times that people felt like it was fantastic service, fantastic was not your word, but it's what sticks in my head, was actually higher for the paraprofessional group. Was that correct? That's absolutely correct. Although I would, I would just add a point, which is it wasn't customer satisfaction. It was the assessment of the quality of the work product by an independent expert who knew that area. So um, there is other evidence that, that people like working with paraprofessionals, but that was specifically about that they do really good work or that they can do really good work. All right, and now, now I'm glad you're on my screen one. I've got two screens here. Um, but yeah, thank you for it, that was great. So Jim, I'm sorry, I kind of rambled on after answering your question. Did um, other folks have questions? I just wanted to add um, to tag on to what you said for, with respect to Jim's question. We have focused on this issue of making sure it's a viable profession. And I think the debate that Justice Petru highlighted is coming up a week from today on in-court representation um, really speaks to that issue. Not only is it going to be a viable career path, but also will it be a useful service to clients if, for example, paraprofessionals are barred from speaking in court. So we really are taking that issue to heart and, and the debate we're going to have next week, I think, is, is directly on point. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up. I do see there was a comment um, Kathy made in the chat. I don't know, Kathy, I'm not quite sure I understand it. If, you, if you're willing to say something about it, I don't know if you see that, Justice Petru, it's about- I do, I do. And I don't know if, I mean, I see Kathy's box, but I don't see yeah. her, so I don't know if she's on right now. Yeah. I, I, I don't so fully I, understand it either. Okay. Then I don't- So it's not just you. <laughs> All right. We won't try to tackle it then. Well, I know that both of you have to leave us in just a couple of minutes. So on behalf of the working group, let me thank you very much for coming to share uh, your progress, your thoughts, your work, your ideas. It was really interesting. And I can see a lot of overlap in what we're doing. So uh, we'll be interested to follow what you do. We also think you may want to follow what we do because uh, if we're gonna be relaxing the restrictions on uh, who can practice, who, who can provide legal services without uh, either being a lawyer or a paraprofessional, that will obviously have impact right. for them as well. Yes, and hopefully one of these days, Allison will both, you know, life will be back to normal and we can just go up or down a flight of stairs to keep in touch about it. <laughs> I look forward to that and we'll uh, look forward to talking to you uh, on, the, on the Zoom in between then and thank you very much. Thank you and hope everyone has a good weekend. Have a good rest of your meeting. Bye.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, why don't we give ourselves a two-minute break and come back at two o'clock for the SAGE committee report and discussion to follow. See you all at two. Memo, which of course came out of our committee discussion uh, that happened, I don't know, two weeks ago or whenever it was, um, which you know turned into a very interesting discussion. And I think we're hoping that today's discussion will be similarly you know, full of ideas and brainstorming um, rather than trying to nail things down before we're, we've really considered all possibilities. So what we were looking at is this initial structure and governance document, um, which uh, would address the proposed regulatory structure of the sandbox, um, including funding, uh, staffing and governance, and conflicts of interest for members of any governing body. And some of that is very specific and mundane, and some of that is much more open-ended and abstract. And there are a lot of related issues. And after, frankly, after sitting through the discussions today that we've had, I think we can see a lot of uh, issues that are very tied to both committees' work. And even while they may be sort of projected for finalizing later, are things that we are all thinking about kind of at the forefront as we work through some of these other issues. So uh, I think we're interested in hearing, you know, all kinds of thoughts today. Our memo um, really started with, and I think we'll, you know, we'd, we'd probably like to more or less talk through, you know, these topics as we've got them in the memo. Uh, although, you know, again, I think we're open. But I'll start with, with one, which is a, a very important threshold issue, which we spent some time discussing at our committee meeting, which really is kind of creation and external oversight of the sandbox. And you know, for those of you who have looked at this very closely, I know that Adel's uh, spent some time looking at this and we've got materials you know, from Mark Tuft and other things in our uh, materials. The Supreme Court obviously is the body that regulates the practice of law. The state bar, which is the regulatory arm of the Supreme Court, if I have cor just correctly described that, uh, was created, I believe, at least in part by the legislature. And there's a, you know, the legislature is absolutely involved in the regulation of practice of law. That's, you know, we have the business professions code, we have statutes that govern the practice of law. All three of those bodies um, certainly potentially uh, will will be involved in the both the creation and then the oversight of the sandbox. And in our meeting, we kind of talked through, and we're so fortunate to have the attorneys from the Supreme Court on uh, our task, on our working group and uh, involved in our committee as well. And that's gonna be an important piece of just figuring out the best way to proceed in terms of you know how to how to set up the sandbox, where is the reporting structure, and um, you know how can this function both in terms of obviously its uh, efficiency, its effectiveness at doing what we need the sandbox to do, also in terms of you know possibly accessing funding, which will be something that we discuss down the road. But as we've seen already today, that that issue permeates much of what we do as a working group, you know, where is the funding going to come from and how are we going to get it? Um, so uh, one, in our discussion in the committee uh, on this issue, it was became pretty clear that um, there's definitely the Supreme Court uh, is, is going to be integral to this. The bar will certainly have some role and we'll have to figure out what makes sense in terms of, you know, resource allocation um, you know, as well as uh, funding, too, from the bar side. Um, but then the legislature uh, certainly uh, can play some role that might help accomplish some funding. Uh, don't know about that. Um, but there are, you know, as we've seen and Randy discussed today, the interplay of, you know, potential rules, for example, that are implicated We've got professional rules that are implicated by the sandbox. We've got statutory considerations. 
So it became clear to us that the legislature is going to play some role here and there's going to be, again, important interaction with the court and figuring that structure out. So we, we kicked this around a bit at our committee call and then John and I uh, had discussion afterwards where we you know, tried to, to think through how can we best figure out this really important piece, including what the options are and what advantages might lie with different options. So um, two members of our committee have volunteered to um, help us direct um, a, a more focused analysis of this particular issue. So Bridget Grammy and uh, Daniel Grunfeld are going to take a deeper dive into some of these issues. Um, not to say we can't and, and should discuss these issues here today and get people's perspectives on, you know, possible role of the legislature, uh, how the Supreme Court, uh, you know, would function. John can can talk a little bit about how it works in Utah. Um, and, uh, you know, we can get whatever input people have on that, but just know that we will be taking, this is obviously very complex and we'll need to take a very close look at what the options are. Um, so I, I, I can stop there if people want to discuss that issue now, or we can continue walking through our, um, our memo. Mary, maybe one, one thing to point out, I, th I think, um, this is an area where we really are very hopeful that our liaisons can be beneficial in helping us think through this. Uh, both the court liaisons and the bar liaisons, you know, they work in this in this in this environment day in and day out. So I'm hopeful that Bridget and Daniel can can uh, reach out to them. And then I think the other, I guess, question maybe for the group would be: Is there does anybody see a parallel here? You know, is there some other you know structure? that lives out there in the California world that has this sort of overlapping dynamic between the court and the legislature or the court and the bar? And, and if so, how are those kind of thought through? Let me take a quick stab at that one by saying there's no good analogy precisely because we're talking about an Article 3, Article 3 is the federal language, but a Article 6, a, a, a Supreme Court supervised entity. There is a very interesting uh, brand new four-person office um, within a newly created or, or uh, changed uh, financial services regulation uh, piece of the state government um, and then the new office, I forget exactly what it's called, but it's uh, the Office of Financial uh, Innovation or something like that. So there is a, an, an, a bit of an analogy, but I don't think we can look to that specific, we might be able to look at them as a way of saying to the legislature, look, you were willing to fund four people to work on innovative financial um, forms. Why don't you fund four people to look at innovative legal forms? Uh, but I don't think we can look to the, uh, to the Financial Innovation Board um, for a lot of insight on uh, reporting structures. I think that because they're not supervised by the by the courts, I think really in many ways the state bar is our best analog. It's obviously much bigger, older, more established, written right into the Constitution, but it is an entity under the state Supreme Court for the regulation of legal service providers. Well, and, and Mary, maybe I can just, before you go on to discipline, mention this other element that, that we, we talked about a good bit, and that is, is this temporary or is this permanent? And, you know, does that play into sort of this issue? I think one of the comments made uh, during our subcommittee meeting was, if it's, if it's only a temporary sort of preliminary effort, maybe you don't want to go to the legislature and ask for statutory revisions to things until... You know, it's a bit more clear, but but that's that's an open question, and obviously one that the the triple LT group is is trying to puzzle through as well. I guess that that's a. Does anybody have any thoughts on the idea that this is either fixed in the law on a going forward basis, or does it sort of work better as a? I hate to use the word pilot. We 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 talked about avoiding the word pilot because that may diminish the interest of innovators, you know, in coming into it. 
Bridget. Yeah, I know I was one of the ones we were talking about this quite a bit in our call. And I do think this is a unique situation where we have the court and the legislature. I can't think of anything else that's, that we could draw from on this. Um, I think we should be, my view is, I think we should be involving the legislature. I don't, I don't know if we need to be changing any statutes yet, but at least with respect to, um, I'm thinking the unauthorized practice of law statutes, for example, may have to be slightly amended to allow us to have some kind of pilot at a minimum and getting their input and helping us work through, you know, how to establish, I, I, I'm one of the ones that hate the word pilot, but I don't know what else to call it. So um, I think something like that, working with them and figuring out how to get that um, address with the legislature and the court together and working with them and getting their input as we build it, I think is really important. Donna? Yeah, so I would just note that, um, that we have been very clear in conversations with the legislature um, that this is, that there will not be an attempt to bypass the legislature, that we will be most certainly working with them. And I wanna make sure that this group is aware of that and doesn't um, doesn't think that we're sort of heading in a direction where the where the legislature would not be involved um, because we certainly will be um, will will be engaging with the legislature on this. Yeah and I think and just to reassure you Donna and I thank you for that information I think our our thoughts and preliminary direction is very much to involve the legislature and to figure out because that certainly seems the best in terms of just increasing stakeholders, increasing people who are, you know, committed to and understand this, this uh, project. Yeah, and certainly there will be, uh, there will be a lot of discussions with the legislature in terms of the level of specificity that's needed in statute versus mm -hmm. the legislature, you know, directing the state bar to develop a program that includes various parameters, right? There's, there are different ways that the legislature um, you know, might choose to regulate regulate with with statute and deferring to the inherent authority of the court um, with uh, over the um, practice of law and what and what that means, but still sort of maintaining some um, direction at the very least on on you know on a direction that they would want to see this go in and direction more probably more importantly that they would not want to see it go in um, and so these are going to be complex conversations um, but I think we'll be able to balance the inherent authority of the court with the um, with the uh, with the statutory authority that the legislature possesses um, you know although this is not sort of the same kind of thing um, it is, there is certainly a, um, that balance that is struck in the uh, admission to the practice of law in some ways where there are uh, some statutory schemes that talk about um, um, like uh, accreditation of law schools. Um, and at the same time, it is very clear that, this, that the Supreme Court has the inherent authority over, over admission to the practice of law. And so it has sort of allowed the legislature and in certain instances to you know weigh in on the admission and so i i imagine we'll sort of we'll figure out what that balance is um but i did want to want to be clear in this public setting uh, about the um, participation of the legislature great and donna it might be helpful to get from you ideas about who you know within the bar is most uh sort of uh, involved in that kind of consideration because we may want to talk with them at some point certainly as we will forward that's and if it's you, oh good. <laughs> well, there we go, perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, so any other comments just on this piece? Okay, um, it, just to continue through this uh, creation and external oversight piece, um, we did spend some time uh, in our committee talking about um, kind of reporting structure. So right now we're kind of, we're addressing both creation and then moving forward reporting. And the uh, I think the consensus and interested in people's viewpoint was that we want a, a pretty nimble, adaptable approach because we don't you know, really know everything that's gonna, the sandbox is gonna want to do and, and we wanna be flexible. And I think John can certainly speak to the experience in Utah around the necessity for that uh, kind of approach. So. Uh, and, and that came up for us in the context of talking about, you know, what role the state bar might might have um, 
and uh, you know how complicated the reporting structure is going to be. So it may be this is something we just have to um, develop as we roll forward and as we you know flesh out on the other side. Obviously, the you know scope of what's going to be included in the sandbox that may help us make some of these decisions um, as we move forward. So I guess the last piece um, in this section is discipline. So. Um, and what I'm interested, the, the issue of discipline of, and we're calling it discipline, you could call it different things. Discipline is obviously the term that, that reflects lawyer licensing. Um, you could look at it a little bit differently. The paraprofessionals had their whole, their own, uh, you know, system of, uh, of carrying out in sort of enforcement or discipline of, of their own, you know, the people involved in that program. Here, the things that we need to think about will be, you know, the role of the state bar in overseeing the sandbox participants and in deciding, you know, involvement in the in a disciplinary process. If indeed, that's where we end up. And I think there's no question that the state bar is always going to be have the authority to discipline lawyers, right? But the sandbox is going to include other types of, of uh, professionals and non-professionals involved. So. You know, the question is going to be, you know, will the state bar have uh, any involvement in overseeing non-lawyers in the sandbox? Uh, would we adopt a kind of model that the paraprofessional group was talking about where, you know, there's a separate board, a kind of, uh, I'll call it a discipline board, where it's made up of, you know, one person from the, uh, the, the, the board itself, an, a licensee, and then it looked like a public member if I saw, if I read the slide right. Um, you know, that's, uh, the, and the, the sanctions that that board could impose includes the things that are, you know, well beyond what we have currently in discipline, including fines, uh, including, as John uh, makes a point of saying, um, you know, one, one obvious kind of discipline, disciplinary sanction that the sandbox authority would have would be to, to remove, revoke someone's sandbox credentials so they could no longer participate. But are we going to is there a good idea to have some kind of separate model like the um, paraprofessional group has? If we did, would lawyers who participate in the sandbox be subject both to state bar discipline as well as you know discipline or enforcement by the by the separate sandbox board? That's a question. Um, another issue would be uh, the adequacy of protections already provided by consumer protection and unfair practices laws and remedies. That's looking at it more on sort of uh, not only the discipline side, uh, what can happen to um, participants who you know, do something wrong, but also the consumer protection side. How do we protect the consumers who might be the, the victims of uh, improper practice? Um, and then of course, an important part here is the need to monitor consumer harm and, and define that. This, some of this discussion you know, we've already had today, this really filters I think through much of what we do is again, how do we protect the public um, as we try to broaden the scope of, you know, services available to them. Um, so on that, I don't know if people want to have any thoughts about the sort of discipline uh, broadly stated. Uh, if not, John, I'll turn it over to you for the structure and composition of the board. Let's hear if there's especially anybody from the task force who wants to address discipline issues. Anybody not on the task force who wants to address discipline issues? I'll throw one uh, idea or question out and it's in part, Mary, you mentioned uh, looking at the adequacy of current protections provided by existing consum consumer protection law. Um, I was re um, really interested by the uh, consent agreements that um, were discussed in the New York uh, what was it called the New York County uh, report, Bar Association report on online legal services. And they looked at LegalZoom's um, litigation. And for example, in North Carolina, uh, LegalZoom uh, settled with, with North Carolina regulators with a bunch of requirements that included things like this jurisdictional um, thing that I mentioned this morning, the point that you you can't, LegalZoom could not waive 
um, being sued in North Carolina, um, or I guess it didn't say anything between uh, lawsuits and arbitration, but being brought to justice in North Carolina, and and that you could uh, LegalZoom was not allowed to uh, waive certain other laws. I think we have lawyers on how law, uh, rules for lawyers about how lawyers are not allowed to waive. Um, basically the ability to be sued for malpractice. Um, and I think thinking about whether there's an equivalent to not letting sandbox participants waive, uh, ha have consumers waive being sued for, I'll call it malpractice, um, is, is a really important question. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and that raises the issue of the application of the rules that apply to lawyers and how they, how and if, if and how they would apply to sandbox participants. Um, the when we've discussed this, um, and I think I'm correct. Uh, Kristen Crispin Passmore has made clear that um, you know participants are held, e even if they're not lawyers, are held to certain standards that apply to lawyers, um, and that would be something that we're going to have to figure out here too. I mean, the paraprofessionals, I found it interesting, are going to draft their own code of ethics. Um, you know, I know how long that takes. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed with their uh, the ambitious schedule. Go, go, Godspeed. Um, I, I don't think we want to do that, but we'll need to figure out, you know, what rules apply and, you know, which of the rules that apply to lawyers should also apply to sandbox participants. And that one's a really good one. I think there's another element there of sort of staying in our lane uh, relative to other regulators out there. I don't know if you noticed that Crispin was listing some of those entities as being regulated by numerous different agencies. And that's pretty, I think, unusual in our US experience where we're used to kind of a regulator of, of, of a business, but, and certainly that's the case with, with law firms. So that, that helps, you know, is to say, well, we're, and then the other piece of it is, can we comfortably have the regulation, excuse me, the discipline of lawyers who are participating in sandbox entities be done by their existing disciplinary system uh, by the bar or, 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 or because that, that would be best, it seems, to not try to rewrite how lawyers participating uh, need to behave when they're in that setting just because they happen to be in that setting. Toby. Yeah, I, I think that's right, but I think that the, 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 the one sanction that's unique to the sandbox needs to apply to lawyers too, and that is the removal from the sandbox. Yeah. yeah so they have to have the dual track. I mean, they may be disciplined yeah. by the state bar and removed from the, from the sandbox. Yeah, it, there is this concept that we're, reg we're regulating the entity now, not the individual, and the entity uh, in this instance would lose its ability to to do whatever it's been permitted to do. And by definition, I think lawyers working in that entity would also be no longer able to do that particular thing. Yeah. There's another sort of element of this that I just I just want to throw this philosophy out because because it's been kind of hammered into me by the economists that that we've worked with. And that would be that, you know, like this question around whether they have insurance or what the arrangement is should be something that the market decides, you know? And if somebody's got a model that works fine and that's acceptable to consumers and the consumers, I think they need full awareness, but if they have full awareness, make that choice to participate in that service, theoretically, because it costs a little less than someone that, that is under a heavier regulatory scheme, then why aren't we letting the market do that if we've protected for a consumer harm? And that's probably a whole nother conversation, but that's, that's the economists uh, coming through from our conversations we've had with them. So John, do you wanna move forward to talking about the board? Sure. Um, I did wanna highlight just quickly, we, we, we jumped over 1B on purpose. 1B was about the function of the sandbox. And I think that ends up being very much like the discussion we had this morning about the scope. And so I would just flag that as something where there's maybe overlap between what the SAGE committee and the scope committee are doing a bit, because some 
something about the function of the sandbox may derive may help us with how it ought to be structured. So mm -hmm. I think it, it may be more clear once we've kind of figured out and settled on what its scope and purpose is to then let these issues around its, um, its structure come from there. Um, on the subject of the composition of the board, this would be, we had a good discussion about, about this in the subcommittee uh, and ultimately sort of came around to the list that Adels had put together to begin with and that's in their recommendations and that's set forth in our summary. Um, but, but, but I think kind of relative to that, you know, what's the purpose of this board? We have a board made up of consumer representative, economist, legal ethics, technology, all of those various facets. What do you all see that board is doing? Are they advisory to the staff and the office? Are they, are they an outward facing group that's articulating the value of the sandbox to you know, the public, to legislators, to audiences like the bar? Um, how, how would you see that sort of, what would you see as that board's role? It's not something we talked about too much in our subcommittee meeting. Yeah, I think one question is, you know, are 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 members of the board going to be, you know, involved in in doing discipline? Are are members of the board going to be vetting applications, you know, that the staff passes on first, or or you know, whatever? Bridget, I see your hand up. I just, I at least the way I've been envisioning it is more of a regulatory board, the way we have occupational licensing board structures right now. So the board, the bar board of trustee is a little bit different as far as, and I, I'm a little fuzzy on this, but they don't, they're not involved in the discipline aspect, right, Donna? They don't do, they, but like, for instance, the medical board, they have their own panels where they ultimately are the decision makers with respect to licensee discipline. So um, I guess that is something we didn't really talk about on our subcommittee and it's something that we should talk about. But to me, I think I envision this board, at least of the way we were talking about it in adults before as being more of a policy, you know, setting the policy. I do, at least if they're not in actually determining which applicants are in and out, they should be having clear guidelines as far as what is in and out and, you know, over who is making that decision. So, um, Anyway, that's just my view as like a traditional regulator. Other thoughts on that or maybe how the, um, is there some other people that ought to be thought about some sort of category of expert or something that should, or, or representative that should be on the board given what Bridget just said? I agree with, sorry, <laughs> I didn't raise my hand. Okay. <laughs> okay good. I, think I got excited. Um, so in the last presentation, I really liked the structure and there was a representative from the community. It's always good um, if we think about like even human subject research, uh, there has to be an, a non-scientist representative of the community to advocate for people's needs. And so I would like to have that role as part of the criteria. And Patricia, there's a characterization of somebody on the board that would be a consumer representative, but I think you're you're thinking about something slightly different than that. Um, it would be similar. Okay. Similar. I do think that there might, you know, in my mind, this question may be a little premature um, because I think the answer may be different depending on who the regulatory authority is. And so if this were an entity that was part of the state bar, um, what the board's role is might be different. And if so, I would also argue to call it something other than a board um, because, because I may be the only one, but I, I get confused. Um, but um, you know, in that instance, you know, the, the state bar's board of trustees would still ultimately be the one responsible for setting policy, um, but, uh, but this, you know, this entity would be um, would be recommending policy and may, you know, may be the one that is either um, that that is um, determining who gets let into the sandbox and how they um, exit the sandbox. Um, I think it, I think it really depends on on who the regulatory authority is. Exactly what the answers to those questions might be. 
The vehicle, one vehicle we've used is to write this manual, which writes out a lot of the policies and procedures and then asks the court to endorse that. I'm not sure it's, you know, what exactly the right term there is, but, you know, that's really the policy control is, is, is at that level. And, I'm, I'm, you know, it has not been something, Donna, that went by our board of bar commissioners, you know, but again, that may be just a structural difference between Utah and California. Yeah, and that would be that would be the same way I would envision the board of trustees being involved. The potentially in this, if the structure were that it were that the this entity were under were part of the state bar, is that they could develop this policy manual um, that would be that would be reviewed and adopted by the board of trustees, right? Building because the this entity, this regulatory authority, would have the expertise, right? They'd be bringing the expertise to the table that the State Bar Board of Trustees would be relying on because the Board of Trustees doesn't have the tech expert, the, you know, the same sort of broad-based representative okay. representation that we would want um, for this entity. I see that our, oh, I'm sorry, Tom, I just want to make a quick note that, that in the Q&A, our public attendee, Stephanie Bond, has noted, she's wondering if there'll be an innovator on the board, which is an interesting question and maybe that's implicit in the idea of it being a technology expert but at some level I suppose the question is if you're an innovator on the board does does that mean you're not innovating in the sandbox you know you probably can't wear both hats uh, but interesting question yeah actually my my comment really is in the same vein if we're gonna be thinking about what kind of folks should be on the board you know, potentially a tech, certainly a tech, at least a technology person, because to the extent we're going to be vetting and sort of regulating in some fashion, um, algorithmic structures, I think you need somebody that can help us with that. You might even want to think about uh, a venture capitalist type person, you know, as somebody else that might be on the board. I mean, if we're talking about building businesses from scratch, um, those are the folks that see you know, if, if you had somebody from Kleiner Perkins or something, they've seen hundreds of presentations mm -hmm. and, you know, how do they assess them? Is this going to be successful, et cetera? So I think we need to think about what, we, what we're what we hoping to engender here and have folks on this board um, that really can help the bar and the public understand what's going on. Well, that's probably a pretty good segue to what Mary was going to talk about next. Uh, the uh, is that the conflict of interest or the antitrust? Well, I, I'm, I was saying about the antitrust. I guess I skipped over <laughs> the conflict of interest. Well, yeah, I'll, we'll just talk quickly about antitrust. Um, you know, the, those of you who've paid attention to this issue over the years know that uh, professional regulation and professional self-regulation is subject to antitrust laws um, and bar attorney regulation is no exception to that. So whatever we devise here, we have to be sensitive to the application of antitrust rules. And I know we have some people on our uh, working group who are much more familiar with and fluent with these concepts than I am. Um, we briefly talked about it in our uh, committee. And I would just, uh, I guess, say that as we move forward, we'll need uh, to always be thinking about the possibility of antitrust uh, application. Um, and you know, probably work with, with somebody uh, and maybe someone on this working group has that expertise, but to make sure that we, we are always uh, on the safe side of that analysis. Bridget? I just wanna say on that point, I do worry about having the board of trustees be the ultimate decision maker policies setter on this, because if they are, um, they are a majority of attorneys, it depends on how you define active market participants, not to get too much into the weeds, but I, I think that could be a problem. So I just wanna flag that. I, don't, I haven't thought all the way through all this, but I, that, that raises an issue for me. Tom? Yeah, if I can, I, I, I actually teach this area of the law. Um, I do think you need to be careful here. I mean, the, the, the most interesting case in this space is, involves dentists in North Carolina. And the question that that was a basically a, uh, self-regulatory guild type deal. The, the law of this is a federalism kind of analysis. Is the state of California, has it decided that it wants to displace 
competition with a regulatory structure. So the, the Supreme Court is the state for this purpose. So if you are blessed by the state in capital letters, um, you can do pretty much anything you want, but you just need to be careful about the state having acted and this not being uh, something in which self-interested folks by themselves are imposing discipline and things of that nature. So it has to be in, in this context, I think having the Supreme Court directly involved is very important. And Tom, if that's the setup, then is there less of an issue about the balance on that board that, that controls the office and in particular, whether there's more lawyers on that board than non-lawyers? Yeah, great question. Um, it, it, it gives you a fair amount of freedom because again, it's a federalism analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and so if the state decides, I mean, it's like, think of prorate regulation of fruit and vegetable crops in California. There are a lot of farmers on those boards, but the only way they get away with it is that there is a, uh, a state official that actually, you know, blesses what they, what they propose to do. Um, so you can have, you know, you can have a lot of interested parties on these things, but the state itself has to both say it wants to displace competition with regulation and it has to enforce or approve of an enforcement. The perspective of the innovators is sort of an interesting to think, to think about. If, if, if the board itself is comprised of a majority of lawyers, perhaps head, headed by a lawyer, the board, uh, and also then the board of bar commissioners has some level of control over that, you know, I guess the question is, does that make non-lawyers who are looking to, you know, invest in projects in, in California wary about whether they're really going to get, um, you know, a, a fair opportunity to, mm -hmm. to put their product into, into the market? Yeah, I mean, I, potentially the, the analysis would be you're dealing with you know, competitors are your regulators. Is that a good idea? Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I think this is going to be a very public process, particularly when the legislature is going to be so directly and substantially involved. Um, and they've done a lot of reforming of the state bar structure already. So I, I think they're probably going to, this hopefully will not be a major problem. Let's see, Mary, where does that take us? Uh, well, if we're going to, if you want to just touch on conflict of interest briefly, and then we'll move yeah. to staffing. Okay. The, the conflict of interest uh, conversation we have is fairly short. Of course, there should be a prohibition against conflict of interest, but I think the useful substance there was that it, it feels more like the type of conflict of interest rules that might be uh, based on an organization or a government and not having, a, you know, to Tom's point, farmers on the wrong board or something to be able to control something that they have a self-interest in and not really around attorney-client conflicts. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of conflicts that would be in the regulatory arena. So I, I, that seemed like a fairly non-controversial point. Does anybody have any, any thoughts about that? Okay, so staffing. So who knows? <laughs> I mean, you know, you can start to write the functions up of, of what certain types of people are going to need to do. There's applications to be processed. There's data to be followed. There's, you know, people to be spoken with who are applications. Um, the real question is, what's the scale need to be? Uh, and how do we predict if, if we can even begin to predict, you know, how many applicants there will be to participate in the sandbox on a weekly or monthly basis. I may have mentioned we see one or two a week in Utah um, and it seems manageable with a staff of two or three so far. And we are striving to have it be streamlined. It's by category, it's not just totally reinventing the wheel with every next application. So it sort of hopefully gets systematized. But I, I don't, maybe others of you from our subcommittee can can weigh in but i don't know that we had a lot of good answers to how to figure out how much staff is needed and whether we can figure that out in the first instance or whether we sort of need to start with you know the likely bare minimum and go from there as needed thoughts on that
Well, the next thing we're going to talk about is, is funding, which also may help drive staffing, <laughs> which may drive a lot of this. Um, so funding is one of the issues, you know, that we're asked to consider as part of this initial uh, governance and structure document. And funding is obviously going to be a key concern. If the if the court is the one that's ultimately, you know, overseeing the sandbox, funding, you know, obviously is very tight for the court, uh, you know, through the judicial council, funding's tight at the bar, funding, you know, is going to be tight everywhere. So and it, clearly an initial and continuing concern will be to identify possible sources of funding and, um, you know, cultivate those as much as possible. Um, uh, the Adels report identified a uh, the need to or the the desirability of holding a sort of conference of prospective funders early on to consider their involvement in the sandbox. Um, so that's we didn't talk about that much at the committee, but certainly given its prominence in the Adels report, we should keep that on the list as a possible means of exploring some funding. Other uh, possibilities, of course, will be to, to try to identify foundation type funding uh, and other you know, areas of funding. The, the applicants to the sandbox, uh, we could decide, of course, that they pay an application fee or then a, some type of participation fee that'll generate some revenue. Um, but you know, I don't think that we have any way right now of identifying you know, specifically how much revenue that might uh, bring in and, and, and help us identify how much additional funding we're gonna need. But clearly we are gonna need to figure out a way to fund this. And uh, you know, again, if we don't have funding, I mean, we can set up a fabulous structure here and spend a lot of time figuring all that out and then it doesn't go anywhere. So, or, or, it's, it, or we have so little funding that you know, we're only, the scale of what we can do is very de minimis which no one wants. So uh, I think something we'll have to figure out is, you know, how to, how to best explore funding. Um, uh, and we'll just keep that, I, I'd be interested in people's thoughts now um, on that topic. Uh, and I think it's gonna be something we're gonna keep returning to. I mean, no one loves to talk about fundraising. So I, you know, I get it. <laughs> Tom, did you have a hand raised from this subject or just left over from before? I think that's just left over. Thanks for asking. Okay, Bridget? Yeah, this is something we talked about in our subcommittee and also at Adels before. And just to re-emphasize the point that from a consumer protection standpoint, it's critical that we have this in this be well-funded because we can't just set something up without having the appropriate level of staff and resources to be able to mm -hmm. monitor this. So. I, I just wanted to point that out as it is a really, really important issue, particularly for public protection. And I think it's helpful that we do have other groups like Utah and um, you know that are exploring this and are ahead of us on this so we can see how they've been doing it. And even for staffing levels, John, I mean, I think as you keep moving forward with your sandbox, we can get a sense um, for what to recommend staffing wise. Um, and then, you know, the different funders that have helped you might be able to help us, or at least you might be able to give us some ideas on how to do it. Um, but I think ultimately uh, the goal would be once we have it up and running that it would be self-funding, right? I mean, like any occupational licensing structure, eventually they're funded by licensing fees. Um, and so, but I, I don't know, just from my experience of learning about other groups that have tried this, I think from the get-go, it takes some startup funding that we are probably going to have to find. Well, an option that our court at least has considered if, if necessary, and this has its a whole set of other implications, would be to simply limit the number of people that we can contemplate as sandbox participants. So, you know, it, it's sort of a first come, first serve until you have X number of, of participants, and that's what your funding really allowed you to do safely. The potential problem with that is you you end up with a whole bunch of people doing something fairly unimaginative, you know, and no room for someone that maybe ha has a has a more interesting option. So, Patricia, do we have a an idea of our budget? What are the we don't have a scope of the project? So, coming from the I, IT background now, 
and I'm thinking about implementations and things like that. So we we don't have our full scope. I understand that, but I, do we have a sense of how much money um, we need to fundraise before we start asking? Because that's going to be one of the questions that um, a potential investor would want to know the the scope and you know the budget. Yeah, we, we certainly don't know. We're not even anywhere close to that, but you're absolutely right. That will be something, you know, as we move forward. And, and you see how all these different pieces all come together to help inform that. So, um, but yes, we will have to, to be getting to the position of, of developing that. And I, I think Becky and I could offer that we're, we're close to having a somewhat official budget you know, in Utah, which is going to maybe just need to be have a factor applied to it to be more more appropriate for California, but it'll hopefully at least give some sense of the type of expenses that we see and are, and how much. Okay. I, maybe that'll be helpful. And okay, I, well, that's I think that's it, Justice Tucker. I don't know if you have some follow up. Well, I have a question on funding uh, for John or anyone else who has an answer to this. Um, do you think that <clears throat> some of the entities that are funding your sandbox as a startup venture would be open to funding a California sandbox as a startup venture because they would say we're in favor of sandboxes, the more the merrier? Or do you think there'd be a sort of, I'm sorry, we've got one, one is enough, California is big enough and rich enough to pay for their own? I mean, Becky probably has a better response to that than I do, Becky. Well, I think uh, I think one thing to recognize is that philanthropic funders are a little bit puzzled that they're giving money to government to do the government's job. No. So it's kind of a hard sell. Um, the 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 entities that were the funders that we've gotten engaged with Utah are the State Justice Institute, which is interested in judicial and regulatory reform, and then Hewlett. Um, because Hewlett's president is Larry Kramer, who used to be the dean of the Stanford Law School, and he's been interested in these issues for a long time. And so I think from these two sources, we probably have three or $400,000, and that pays for probably 2.0 FTE staff, all of whom are undercompensated for the work that they do, and then everyone else who, who works on that project is a volunteer. Um, and that works, I think, when something is new and people are really, really engaged with it and the scale is manageable by a group of 12 people, I guess we are, or 11. Um, I would think California would get a lot bigger very fast. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, another place, another thing you would want to think about, whatever my politics are, Coke has a lot of money and they don't re like regulation and they have a program on permissionless innovation, which is a classic kind of Coke way of describing things. You know, what are the political considerations in having funders with very clearly marked out positions on the issue be involved? And when do you need people who are sort of more neutral seeming? Um, but that's something to, to figure out over time. Neil, I see your hand up. Oh, and Eric. Yeah, yes. hi. Uh, so yeah, so one thing to flag and, and a question for, for you, John and, and, and Becky as well, is um, if, for example, now there's a lot of what ifs and we keep, we, we've gone through a lot of them today, um, but one of the what ifs is if in fact the regulator and the board is set up under the Supreme Court, right? And then that uh, regulator is funded by say Hewlett Packard raises a question about then if a case involving Hill of Packard comes to our high court, does the entire court have to recuse itself? So I'm wondering, John, whether you have policies with, with, with the Utah Supreme Court that address that issue? We have not developed a policy around that, Neil, but it's a, it's a good concern. I think. Yeah, and, and so what I also want to flag too is that, um, you know, a lot of these foundations, they're even, uh, will file AC briefs in matters that are here in front of our court. And so I just raised the concern that the more funders you have, the more of the danger of possible recusal of the entire court. So, um, which is why we're very curious to know what your budget is like and you know how big it is 
and to get a sense of what's out there. Because we know, again, a lot of what ifs here. You know, ideally, if the legislature would fund this and, it, and the funds came that way, that'd be great. But our budget situation right now is really up in the air. So, but just something I wanted to flag for the group. Eric. Uh, Neil, this is actually kind of a, a follow up question to that because I, I had a similar thought. But the one is Hewlett, I just know from sort of having worked with them and received funding, they're a big fan of, of what Rebecca's talking about, which would be yeah. pairing with another uh, foundation. So, one possibility would be to go to ask. Uh, a couple of foundations with interest. Arnold Foundation is another one um, that could be tied to sort of research uh, that comes out of this on the legal innovations. I think they might like that, the, the, the nature of the sandbox in that respect. I guess my question is, would Hewlett is a foundation that's sort of Hewlett money. It's not the, the Hewlett Packard company. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I don't know is, are we does that limit this sort of concern? Because you might think that Hewlett Packard, the company, might be sort of involved uh, in sort of litigation that come before it. it. It's a little harder to think of the foundations. And so I wondered if that gives us a little bit of- It might, of, it might, yeah. Okay. It, it all really depends. I, I'm not familiar with the actual structure of the foundation, but it sounds like from what you're saying, it's arranged to maybe kind of minimize these issues. Yeah, I, I think so. I think in 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 that particular case, and I think the same thing goes with the Coke Foundation, is that they're they're sort of separate entities from the the Coke Industries or Hewlett right. Packard. It's it's actually the the founders. Money. I actually don't know that for certain, but it um, I do think there's like an effort to sort of separate those two because I, I see your point. If we were to get money from, you know. I'm trying to think like, you know, a, a large corporate donor that, that would sort of give one, you know, that could be a real issue. It could, yeah. Bridget? Or, or Eric? Oh, no, you, you just went. Bridget? I was just going to say, just thinking through this, you know, from my experience as, at a university and getting funds from donors, sometimes you can have like donor agreements, right, where part of the, part of the terms are you will not tell us how to do what we're doing or you, you know what I mean? Like, so I wonder if we can address that issue that Neil raises, which I agree is really important by some kind of agreement on the outset about the funding and the way it's gonna work. I don't know if you think that would work for you, but it's a thought. Yeah, Kathy. Hi everyone. So um, this is my area of expertise, so I can finally chime in. But um, something that we did recently is we did a funders briefing, and that was a way to invite different groups in to just hear about what's going on, and um, that may be an avenue that we take. And secondly, I used to work for the County of Los Angeles, and uh, we did receive grants. Um, a lot of funders, they, the only requirement was that there was some sort of fiscal intermediary, which was a a nonprofit or another organization that can deal with the funds that doesn't look like the government, even if it has the same name, but maybe they have a, a nonprofit ID. So that's another option that we can take. And, and we didn't have problem getting extra funding before. So throwing in my two cents. Great. I think that pretty much, John, unless you have other thoughts, I think that kind of gets us to where we, we were in our memo. And uh, I don't know if people have any other thoughts they want us to think about further as we try to pull together this next draft. Again, you know, this is a kind of, unlike scope where there are sort of some immediately kind of juicy topics that you can, you know, really all think about this is a little bit, in a sense, sort of more abstract, but also like deadly practical at the same time. And it's really hard to, to mesh the two where we are. So we do appreciate, you know, any input that you guys do have, and we will do our best to, to move this along. Not seeing any uh, additional comments on this subject, I want, and remembering that I cut off the scope conversation kind of abruptly so that we could all head to lunch. Um, are there people who have comments they wanted to share this morning that we didn't get to? Or maybe after lunch, you thought of some other things you wanted to share that go to the scope issues we were discussing this morning?
Seeing no hands on that subject either. Um, I think we're ready to move to the okay, what happens next subject. Um, Randy, do you want to start us off on that? Uh, sure. So we do have the next uh, assignment. And in the uh, game plan that we have discussed, we are looking at uh, assignments to uh, alternate between the scope group and the SAGE group uh, with regard to uh, overlapping uh, work. And so the initial assignments that we started with uh, went to uh, each. And so you both, each subcommittee both has an assignment. And as I mentioned earlier, we would be looking to uh, take that on for at least uh, three meetings and hopefully uh, get to the point where we have some degree of consensus on uh, what happens next uh, in terms of uh, voting on a scope document or at least up the recommendations that would comprise a scope document. And similarly with the uh, SAGE assignment for structure and governance as well. Um, but then while you're working on those three meetings, I wish we'd had one already, there would be additional assignments. So what happens next is that um, you continue to receive uh, assignments uh, on top of the ones that have already been given. And so there is some multitasking. You would, um, if you're on scope and if you're on SAGE, you would again have your subcommittee meetings and continue to take back from the full working group uh, all of the thoughts and the discussions that have been raised and then try to advance your uh, proposals uh, for fleshing out the scope document and the structure and governance document. But for the next meeting, we would be sending out soon an assignment memo, much like the first assignment memos that went out. This time it would be going to scope and would be looking at sort of application and eligibility issues. And so in a way that's sort of the next uh, granular level of you know, jumping from big, broad scope issues, now talking about application and eligibility, but that would be the next assignment. And that one would also be one contemplated for running for about three meetings, but now they, they are overlapping. And at the next meeting, uh, SAGE would get a similar assignment. So no one gets left out. Uh, the overlapping assignments would, would continue. And we would, again, use the same process where uh, the assignments would invite submissions via email to staff for the subcommittee co-chairs to uh, review and be uh, discussed at the subcommittee meetings. And then when the subcommittee uh, submits its report for the full working group, again, give opportunity uh, for email comments to be able to advance the discussion. So we make the most use of our time when we're uh, here all together. Uh, but that's what happens next. We, we are working on the subcommittee meeting schedule. Um, Lauren has already populated a calendar where we're trying to get both subcommittees in between meetings throughout the entire year. And I think that's gonna go out soon, um, but the assignment will probably come out um, around the same time. Uh, but that's what's next. Assignment to scope for application and eligibility criteria. Next meeting, uh, a new assignment will be coming down the pipe for, for SAGE. Thank you. So as the subcommittees work on preparing a document for the next meeting, uh, please think of the document in terms this time of, this is the proposal we want to suggest that the committee adopt. Uh, it doesn't have to be unitary. It can be in multiple chunks, however many chunks you think you have uh, a proposal to make on. Um, and don't worry too much about uh, the exact, uh, you know, prettiness of and, and consistency of form. We'll obviously have to do some wordsmithing of the whole report when we're way down the line uh, finished. But if we could at least um, have some concrete proposals that you would like us to vote yes on um, with as much explanation as you would like to provide us as to why you are proposing this. That would be wonderful. 
And then when we go through the round of email comments like we did last time, I suspect that there will be more than just one comment because we'll have a lot more uh, fleshed out and concrete uh, proposal to be looking at um, as we go into the next plenary session. Are there questions from anybody or concerns from anybody about this process? or about what happens between now and our April meeting. Seeing no hands, uh, it looks like we're gonna be breaking early today, um, which I'm sure no one is upset about, but I wanna make sure we don't break while there are still things that anybody in this virtual room thinks that we need to uh, vet need to hear about, need to talk about, and so on. So uh, let's just call it uh, remarks for the good of the working group. Is there anybody who has any uh, closing comment or concern they'd like to, or question they'd like to raise? All right, seeing none, I will say thank you to everybody who presented, who prepared, who commented, contributed, um, and made today's meeting a success. Thank you for the hard work. Thank you in anticipation of the hard work you'll be doing between now and our April meeting. And the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank Good you. meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so Thank much. You.